All right, CR, I can't think of a better Amazon description for a movie probably ever than this. This is the actual Amazon description for The Big Chill. Ex-college friends reunite in a big house after a funeral to play old records and talk. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The only thing that could have been better is if the LAPD was involved <laughs> <Right>. somehow. <laughs> Directed by Michael Mann. Yeah. <laughs> um, this is like in your real house. This yeah. is a 40-year-old movie, by the way. It's the 40th anniversary this year, and uh, it has somehow held up really well, and I don't understand why. I think the things that we're going to share is this may be the first movie that we, re like, this is an inherited rewatchable for all of us, because I bet this is our parents' movie. Yes. This is a movie that's kind of about our parents, probably. And this is the one that they were like, please watch this with me. And it was on all the time. So it, this was not like my discovery. This I really feel like this is like my mom's movie. I think with the, whether it's universal is kind of a fun conversation, though. Like whether it actually applies to people who are 37, 38 right now and whether they relate to it meaningfully is a, is a big open question. Because Lawrence Kasdan, who wrote and directed it, thinks it is. He thinks it's a movie for everybody arriving at this time in their life. Other people might disagree. They might say, this is only for boomers. This is the yeah. boomer movie. Well, the key theme of the movie is probably unique to the time, but I think the central premise of gathering together with these people that you spent an incredible amount of your time with for a short period of time, and then you kind of all go your separate ways, but then when you get back together, it's like that long period of time when you're apart evaporates. Yeah. Right. right. And I think that's a universal theme, right? I just lived it. I was in Cape Cod. I saw all my Holy Cross buddies for one day. And I hadn't seen some of them in eight, nine years. And within like two seconds, it's back. we were just yeah. busting each other's balls and making the same jokes we made when we were like 20. What? Why did you want to do this for your birthday movie? Happy birthday. Yeah, happy birthday. Though. Well, it was on the short list of we got to do these. We we these we got to do these movies. And this was always, I, this is one of the movies I've seen the most times. Um, and the anniversary and the other thing. And I, I feel like if we didn't do it now, when are we going to do it? But um, there's so many ways to go with this. Do you want to just start with the friendship thing? First of all, this movie has been, people have made runs at this theme for 40 years since and nobody cracked it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That there's been no, oh, this is the big chill for this generation. People have gotten close in a couple ways. I remember Beautiful Girls Tried in the mid-90s and there's a movie called About Alex in the mid-2010s. That didn't get there. Indian Summer tried yeah. to do this in the early 90s. 30-something mm -hmm. tried. There's been a million well, famously, kind of Netflix shows. Well, famously, the precursor to this movie, Secaucus 7, yes. is, is like this, yeah. Um, there was that Friends, Friends from College show on uh -huh. Netflix. Mm -hmm. And you just feel a lot of the mumblecore stuff, I feel like, is in this vortex mm -hmm. too. 10 um, years. You ever see 10 years? The, yeah, 10 yeah, years yeah. is another oh, yeah. one. I kind of like 10 years. Yeah, it's pretty good. Great cast. But none of them did with this movie. There was a movie called The Intervention, mm -hmm. uh, which like, came out a couple of years ago that was like Natasha Leone's in it. It's kind of like this. Yeah. I don't remember that one. Yeah. It was an indie movie. So where does this stand for you, CR? As far as like a friendship movie? Just anything. <sighs> well, I think of it. I, I, I love reading about the making of this movie because they talk a lot about the fact that they all got to become very close in the rehearsal period leading up to it. And the only other time I've read about something like this, I'm sure other people rehearse a lot, but like this intense period of like living together, building up the story, building up the characters is Dead Poet Society, which is another movie where you're like, these kids feel like they actually go to school with each other and they actually live with each other and they're actually growing up together. And so that feeling with like where you're like, this isn't just a job for the people who I'm watching. And they're, you know, it does feel like a generation of actors was captured right at the right moment mm. of all of these people. And it, it's a completely different time in Hollywood. But I think that it just feels incredibly genuine. And that transcends any kind of datedness that happens, whether it's with the music or whether it's like it's the politics of it. I think I, this movie, I was always warned against it. It was sort of like, this is for the generation before you. And it's like when they got rich and fat and you know we're just reflecting on what they could have been and how they like sold out the generation that they came from and the movie is received with like a lot of suspicion by a lot of people but i think in many ways it took a long time for me to realize that that is very much the point of the movie that the movie is a fully understanding like it's it feels warmly towards the characters but not necessarily what happens to you yeah. as you go through life yeah and that kasdan is very um kind of mixed and ambiguous on his youth being like a radical person and then becoming the guy who wrote Indiana Jones, you know, like that the, there is like, 
it, it, it's okay to feel conflicted about what your life has become. It's actually, that's the point of art is to kind of reckon with that as opposed to just like, here's a bunch of white people singing Motown songs in a kitchen. Well, and that's like, how I think I grew up with it and now I watch it and I'm like, oh, I think this movie is a lot more critical of Harold, for instance, than I, th- I ever thought it was when I was like a teenager watching this with my mom. Yeah, so it hits it hits a bunch of themes, right? Like that friendship theme that we talked about. Like if, if you spend enough time with a group of people, they're always going to be your friends, right? And it's just a different language and different rhythm than anything else you're going to have. There's also that part, and I think, what do we? How old do we think that people are in this movie? Like late thirties, probably 30s, like thirty seven, yeah. thirty eight. Where a lot of people hit this point where they had all these dreams when they were in high school and college and after, and I'm going to do this, and I'm going to do that, and I'm going to save the world, or I'm going to become the biggest writer or whatever. And a lot of people hit that point in their late thirties. We're like, Oh shit, that stuff's not going to happen for me. Mm-hmm. And now uh, I have these two kids and I'm married and I'm just grinding out work days every day. And I really thought this was going to be different or then you end up like Alex mm-hmm. where it's like, I kind of peaked when I was in college and man, maybe I should have taken that Rutledge fellowship, but mm-hmm. I didn't. And then the pastor says in the beginning where he's like in a series of, seemingly random jobs, which was a nice way to say Alex was just fucking drifting through life and yeah. couldn't figure out what he wanted to do. So you have that piece. And then just how everybody relates when some people are doing better than others when you all started on the ground floor or something. So it's doing all of these different things on top of when you have relationships with people from way back when and there's still things lingering mm-hmm. that maybe you didn't totally address, especially if it was male friends and female friends. And they just throw everyone in a house and they just like basically set a match to it. Yeah, the the thing I love the most is the way it captures how your friends in college are often friends out of circumstances. Whether you like live next to them in a dorm, you have class with or them. random luck. It's yeah. just like Jacko lived next to me. Like right. if he'd been in another dorm, I may, n- might not have Same ever me. met him. All my best friends were proximate to me. But when yeah. you get to like maybe when we moved to New York, it was more of like, I'm going to zero in on this person right. that I've decided I want to be friends with. And like we're going to actually develop a relationship. Yeah. Whereas like I love the guys I went to college with and I kind of kicked around colleges, but – that was like much harder to be like, oh, I guess like you were in the band t-shirt that I like, so I'll just stand next to you until like we're friends. And <laughs> Let's I, hold beers in a crowded place together, <laughs> stand next to each other. Awkwardly. I always love the scene in Big Chill when they're, when it kind of is falling apart and Nick is like, wrong, we knew each other for a short period of time a long time ago and like you don't know me at all. Like that's almost- Nobody the, had a cushier than us. <laughs> yeah. It was easy back then. <laughs> <laughs> but I think it's a very incisive way of looking at the way like, you you maybe decide who somebody is when you're in your 20s and then you don't really allow that person to evolve or change in your mind like that. The thing that's interesting about this one though is, and it it makes it very different from Sakaka 7, the John Sayles movie, and different from, from a lot of these movies is that even if all of these people, none of them feel like they've totally realized their dreams, they're all really successful. Like yeah. almost like otherworldly successful that a group of people like this, a guy who started his own sneaker company that was acquired by Nike, a huge TV star, a feature writer for People Magazine, like a corporate lawyer. Like, these people did really well. Somebody who married well. Yeah. <laughs> right, right. Wears really nice tennis sweaters. <laughs> a guy who deals pills. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> With the exception of Nick, who obviously is perhaps the most yeah. soulful, complicated, has lived the most. But you even know? Nick seemed like he he, he had yeah, the first Porsche. podcast. Yeah. yeah, he did. <laughs> he he did. created, Nick created podcast. He invented the Fraser Crane too. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> we, Nick created life advice. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, the other piece of this is, and this is like really, I feel like unique to, pe- to people my age who had parents from this generation was, you know, there's specific um, people who were in college in the late 60s, early 70s who felt like they needed to change the world. It was the first time in America where people were like, this place, we we have to fix stuff. This is not going well here. And it's going to be us, the, pe- the young people. And they all went out into the real world all idealistic mm-hmm. and then it slowly changed as the 70s went on my my parents were both teachers and my mom was going to be a social worker and you know 20 years later my mom's running a jewelry store yep. yeah you know and that 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 was pretty common for that era and i think what they thought this movie was about when they were making it was what happens when a group of people who think they're part of this bigger movement and they're going to change the world as they get older and they realize yeah be kind of sold out. It, it may have been inadvertent, but this is a movie that taught me to be cynical. It's not, It's it actually had the kind of opposite effect that it was originally sure. grounded in, mm. which is that 
you know, I watched this happen to my parents where they, my parents were not revolutionaries by any standard, but they were just like desperate to claw out of middle class them and to just have more money and be more successful and be more comfortable because as you get older, you're like, the whole idea of the movie is like, it used to be about us and now it's about me. Yeah. And what's, what's in it for me and how will I be happier? And it, like, if you're a young kid and you see a movie like this about the generations that come before you, you're like, okay, well, they learned th that lesson for me. Thanks. And then that's why, like, Reality Bites hits. <laughs> and you see Reality Bites and you're like, oh, that's why Troy is like, fuck everything. I yeah. don't care. And yeah. now, but then we turn into guys in our late 30s and early 40s and whatever, and we're just doing podcasts about Reality Bites. And we're like, <laughs> the 90s were the best. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, we became these people. Yeah. We just didn't necessarily have the, like, we were maybe at the forefront of a political vanguard like these guys were, but... I remember sitting on long road trips with my mom, and I'm sure we'll talk about the soundtrack for a, a long time, but just this is what she played. She would just play the Big Chill soundtrack over and over and over again, and I'd just be like, Mom, there's so much good music. There's like yeah. Aerosmith, you know? Like, <laughs> and uh, I'm now that person, you know what I mean? Like, now I just listen to the bands that I was t in college listening to and but bands the, that sound like those bands, but yeah. But you might also listen to some of these bands. And that's the other thing is that this set the template for what the Harold character is talking about, which is so interesting where he's like, music, there is no, no music. Better, better music. This yeah. is the only music in my house. Yeah. And I felt like that held for a longer period of time than any other era it of music. It just stopped when Jan Winter left the rock and roll I mean, <laughs> and it's, and that's notable, right? Yeah. That that is still going on. I mean, the other thing too is just that like generationally, baby boomers are just still in power. I mean, they're, they're the president and the person who's going to run against him and all of these people. Like, those people are, they still run the country. And they were trying to change things. And then they grabbed power and they were like, we're not letting go. And so this movie, to look at it in that context, is fascinating. Because it's not like it used to be where people who were 50 or 55 or 60 ran the world. It's like 75-year-olds, 80-year-olds yeah. running the planet. Who probably love this movie. I'm sure. Yeah, Mitch McConnell loves this movie. <laughs> <laughs> well. You think, like, how many movies were of that mindset of this generation that is going to try to change the world, right? There's that, all those were made, there were all the Vietnam movies that were made, then there were all the, America's a little more sinister. And yeah. The Wall conspiracy, Street, yeah, yeah, all yeah. those kind of movies. The Bright Lights, Big City kind of. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And they were kind of juggling all three of those. And then I felt like when the 90s hit, then we moved into the, a little bit more of a Forrest Gump. Right. Hey. Yeah. It's kind of great to be here. And then just crazy versions of other types of movies like Reservoir Dogs. I feel like there's a class of director. Robert Zemeckis comes to mind. Forrest Gump. Ron Howard comes to mind. Mm -hmm. A few people who were kind of the post-Lucas Spielberg crew. Mostly guys. Mostly white guys. Who grew up in the 60s and 70s. Their careers got started in the late 70s. They had huge success and were thinking about their own idealism in their early movies. And then as they get older and they get wealthy and successful, all their movies become about like, the world is going to be okay. Right. Because I'm yeah, okay. There's yeah. an optimism. Yes. Yeah, you're right. And that's an unusual thing that happens, but it's because your worldview as you get older and more successful becomes smaller. It doesn't get bigger. You know, your life becomes more closed and it becomes more about your family and about the job that you're doing. And that's really it. So this movie is like right before that happens for Lawrence Kasdan. You know, it's right before he, you know, like Grand Canyon is an interesting double pairing with this movie yeah. because of the way that it's clearly him but the way that he has evolved the way that he thinks about the world too and that movie's really optimistic yeah much more optimistic than this movie yeah it's it's weird because I leave this movie happy but it's also not that optimistic yeah I think that's one of the brilliant things about it but they also they strike oil with the actors I mean mm -hmm. I was the, gonna the say William Hurt at this point in his career Glenn Close as she's becoming a comet um, Kevin Klein, who's one of the most likable lead actors we've had in the last 40 years. And uh, and Behringer, they're in this amazing Behringer run mm -hmm. where he's from like, you know, basically all through the 80s. And if you were just buying baseball cards of these people, you would have you would have treated all of them equally, I feel like. Yeah, it's so funny to go back through the filmographies of the actors in this movie. And, you know, we talk a lot about how the industry has changed or they don't make certain movies like they used to. But when you go back to the early 80s movies that, like, Mary Kay places in, and I think she tears off, like, Private Benjamin, Modern Life, this, in terms of endearment, I'm like, they do not make movies like that anymore. Right. Where, yeah. like, the description of the movie is, like, two people, and then a third person shows up and upsets the apple cart. And you're like, oh, like, that was that was enough for a 90-minute feature. And these people were really, really good 
at playing pretty approachable, knowable characters, you know? Well, it's also not judgmental about them, which I think is a really fascinating 2023 piece to this. Mm -hmm. Cause I feel like if they make this movie now, Meg becomes the most sympathetic character. The JT Lancer character is much more of a self parody. Mm -hmm. Harold's probably just way more of a sellout. I, I feel like they would have blown out different pieces. One of the things I liked is I really felt like these were all real people. Mm -hmm. Like Behringer yeah. becomes JT Lancer. But as soon as he's in the house with these people, he's like, all right, this is my safe place. Yeah, I gotta like, go these, to the yeah. these people yeah. all knew me when I was fucking throwing up outside my dorm room. Meanwhile, he's on the cover of Us Weekly. He's probably, you know, he's basically Magnum P.I. He doesn't seem like an ego monster at all. Not he's at all. He's very ambivalent about his success, which is like, really interesting. Like, he's like embarrassed by yeah. it. Um, Kevin Klein, same thing. Obviously, he's built this, Harold's built this, uh, you know, awesome shoe company mm. that's about to get bought. But he seems like he's pretty grounded in whatever that is. And, I don't know. I, the friendship pieces of this is so carefully and meticulously like that. That in the the end scene when they had the big fight the night before William Hurt and and Behringer, right? Blow up, and the next morning they're having coffee, and um, Behringer comes in. William Hurt's in the table, and he just it, it, it's not even at the cameras. It's like on the left side. He just comes behind him, and he just kind of hugs him from behind. And he sees him who he is yeah. and like pats his. That's like, that's what happens when you're like really friends with somebody. You might have an argument the night before, but the next day it's like, we're, we're fucking we're brothers. Good. We're yeah. good. Yeah. Yeah. See our in Greenwald after every pod. <laughs> totally. <laughs> after, from behind hug. I'm sorry about what I said about winning true time. Detective yeah. Season yeah. one, when they got through <laughs> it, man. talked over me. <laughs> but I very rarely do movies pull that off correctly. But I think it goes back to what Chris said about the rehearsal time. Yeah. There's like real chemistry in like a crazy way with the actors. The more I think about this movie, especially like in the context of doing a pod about it, the more it's like basically one of the songs, like one of the Motown songs on the soundtrack where you watch it and you're like, man, this is just like a warm bath. I love watching these people hang out. I love yeah. watching like who's going to get Meg pregnant. Like it just plays out. And then when you watch it over and over again, just like if you listen to one of those Motown songs over, you realize the levels of emotional complexity and also screenwriting architecture and storytelling work that goes into the twenty minute, the first 20 minutes of this movie where you're just like, I know everything about these people and they mm -hmm. haven't spoken really. Like, yeah, we, Chris to ask me this, is the first 20 minutes up there with like the best 20 minutes a movie's had. And well, especially because of what Chris just said, the thing that jumped out to me watching it again, obviously it has this amazing montage that introduces you to the whole world and Alex's death at the same time, yeah. which is ingenious filmmaking. But I, whenever we do a movie for the show, I always watch the movie with closed captions because I want to know the lines. I want to follow closely like what they're Did trying to do. Did somebody say something in the background right. of the scene or something like that? And when you watch this movie with the closed captions, Heard It Through the Grapevine is you see the lyrics. And that song is a perfect example of what you're talking about, which is like a really emotionally difficult and wrought song. It's a yeah. really sad song and a really like a uh, wounded song, but it, it's so catchy. And, and it's, it's popping so, on the captions. Yeah. yeah. And so when you think about it in that, I mean, it's a perfect song for the movie. Now, the, the, that's a song that is like built into our, like we're hardwired with that song now in our culture. So we don't think about it that critically that much anymore. The same thing with the movie. If you've seen it a hundred times, you don't think about it too much. But when you're paying close attention and you see the way that, you know, not just that Alex is being sh like, it almost seems like a woman is dressing her husband yeah. to go out to a party, but also that there's like a real melancholy throughout the whole movie that they're trying to communicate to you right off the bat. And it's also what's, I heard it through the grapevine. All these people are hearing about Alex dying and getting ready to go to this funeral. Like it's a purposeful choice to use that song at that moment, you know, and like just those little details that he make sure he gets right and never do you feel like everything anything is like labored over right you're like oh my god it's we're already at the reception and i and, and like it's 19 minutes and you think about like sometimes you'll be watching movies and you're just like oh my god it's only it's only been 21 minutes like, right. and we're still doing this like this is like so fast grapevine's so good you think like they peaked with this song choice and then the fucking Rolling Stones come in <laughs> and it's used as well as oh, you're going to ever perfect. use a song in a movie. Yeah. It's because she's playing. With the organ. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's yeah. so good and just the way they cut to each person reacting to it. Um, this is one of the, we said this during the Boogie Nights pod. This is a movie where you can make a Spotify playlist of all the songs in order of when they're in the movie and you can kind of feel like you're watching the movie because mm -hmm. it's mm -hmm. like almost like a jukebox for the movie. I, I think it's one of the best crafted 
movies. It was so interesting, interesting to see the kind of critical response to it, which we'll go into a little bit later. But people were like, eh, like some well done stuff here. But yeah. And I was like, man, like and now as the years pass, as we've seen so many people try to take a run at a movie like this, how hard it is to just bring in a group of people, get all the all the stuff you need, all the nuances to bang home that these people are truly friends, give them some reason to be together, give them some sort of big picture purpose. Like nobody's making this movie again. I don't see it. Well, or it'll be a TV show, which will be probably even worse. Sorry, Sean. No, uh, yeah, that depresses <laughs> the shit out of me. Uh, I mean, on the one hand, they picked a lot of hit songs, right? They picked, which like, how hard is it to pick hit songs? On the other hand, it's true to the experience of the characters. And I guess Meg Kasdan, Lawrence Kasdan's wife, you know, helped curate the soundtrack and worked with him on it. And they were just literally picking songs that would have been popular to these people in 1968, 1969, when they were all together. Yeah. And then it plugged them back into their life, however number of years later, which to your point earlier is like, that is what happens. Yeah. You know, you just like, I, I'm still listening to Nirvana. <laughs> like, I'm going to listen to Nirvana till I die because that's just, that stuff kind of becomes a part of you. And so it isn't just as simple. The other thing that I think is interesting about it is we didn't have Spotify in 1983. Mm -hmm. It wasn't as easy right, to just hear the song you wanted to hear right away. You had to find, like, to seek that's it out. That's why this soundtrack's so it. popular. Is yes. You know, like, that's why, like, our moms they listen did a to it all the time. Yeah, did a combo. You're right, though. It is this Boogie Nights, Goodfellas, Pulp Fiction Pulp Fiction is a good one for this. Where it's like Saturday Night Fever. You, you would almost describe the scene as the the music girl is scene, part of the, the scene. weight scene. Yeah, you, know, you make me feel like a natural woman scene rather yeah. than the yep. scene where this happens. Right. Like my wife the other night was like, "Oh, tell me what. Let let me know when they're about to do the weight." Right. And right. I was like, "Oh, okay." And I know exactly where that happens. Yeah. And like what what happens the night before, and then it, it's yeah, it's just so many perfect music cues in this. When I was with my buddies last weekend, they we had one of those whatever the little Bose speaker thingies, mm -hmm. and uh, so I was like, "I'll, I'll play me because I have all the stupid playlists." We, the only music we listened to was like eighty-seven and ninety, <laughs> and ninety-one and ninety-three. Yeah, yeah. that was it. We're all together. It's like, of course, we're just going to listen to those songs again. Uh, you guys want to listen to Olivia Rodrigo? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you guys heard guts? It's just a bunch of bunch, bunch of guys in a house <laughs> listening to guts. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> what's more what's more pathetic seven guys who went to Holy Cross listening to Olivia Rodrigo or me by myself in my garage <laughs> listening to Olivia Rodrigo some people would be like seven guys who went to Holy Cross listening to Dinosaur Jr I don't know oh my god Dinosaur Jr is still still banging it out man I'll tell you that Lawrence Kasdan Barbara Benedict were college friends they started writing it in uh, 1980 and uh, it was a little semi-autobiographical he, Kasdan was Body Heat. He was working on that Body Heat we did on the rewatchables. Yeah. What was that month? Uh, sexy, sultry, sleazy. S sexy, noir, yeah. noir, yeah. sexy month, whatever yeah. we called it. <laughs> Your commitment to branding is just <laughs> second and done. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> that was our biggest month ever, right? Those, those are the cruising, most popular yeah. episodes we've ever done. People yeah. loved it. Well, yeah. cruising's the most popular rewatchable of all time. <laughs> the, uh, two. <laughs> when are we going to recruise? Re I'd the like re to recruise. We're going to do that live for I wanna, a live, I wanna live show. Live. Yeah. Live show. <laughs> I've got some venues in mind. <laughs> Kasdan said the big chill is about a cooling process that takes place for every generation when they move from the outward directed, more idealistic concerns of their youth mm -hmm. to a kind of self absorption, a self interest, which places their personal desires above those of the society or even an ideal. All right, so this movie was nominated for three Oscars, including Best Picture. Best Picture nominees that year. The Big Chill. The Dresser? Mm-hmm. What was The Dresser? Never heard of this movie. Um, I've never seen it. It's a Albert Finney and Tom Courtney. Uh, Albert Finney is an, an aging, great actor. And The Dresser, the titular character, is Tom Courtney, who's his personal assistant. Mm. The Right Stuff, Tender Mercies, and then Terms of Endearment wins. Kazdas does not get uh, nominated for Best Director. None of the men get get uh, nominated, and Glenn Close gets nominated for Best Supporting Actress. Um, the William Hurt not getting nominated is fucking insane. I just can't believe it. He, what? Does, he does win a bunch afterwards. What? I just can't believe what he didn't get nominated. What categories? Is he supporting, supporting actor? actor? 
I think they Klein, all have to be I think supporting Klein actors. Should be best actor, probably. Okay. You think? Of of for this film, yeah. I think I think if you were gonna put somebody in best actor, it would be Klein. Yeah, I mean, I, no one was gonna beat Jack Nicholson in this year. No, so, so it doesn't really matter. I guess it doesn't. You don't think this should get best picture though, right? Do you? No, I think Terms of Endearment should have. I but think right stuff should have. But best supporting actor, Nicholson wins. That. What do you say? <laughs> mm, the dresser, but I haven't seen it. <laughs> Well, it's great take. <laughs> the supporting actor category is a disaster. Rip Torn got nominated for Cross Creek. Yeah. Rip Torn. I like Rip Torn. Come on. Artie? What's Cross Creek? I know he's Artie, but what's Cross Creek? Um, uh, it's, it's a film that came out that year. Alfred Winter was also nominated for Cross Sam Creek. Sam Shepard for The Right Stuff. John yeah. Lithgow for Terms of Endearment. And Charles Durning, To Be or Not To Be, as SS Colonel Earhart. Mm. Uh, that'll be a performance that lives in infamy. Um <laughs> It's a Mel Brooks movie. It's a good movie. Fine. You think and Mel then, Brooks uh, guy? Glenn Close didn't win. Would you, would you have been good with Glenn Close as the only Oscar from this? Uh, Oscar nomination? I don't. It doesn't keep me up at night, but probably. I think about it every day. I, I don't think every so. Day. I, I think if, if I, it, yeah, I would be bothered by it. I do think that William Hurt is the standout. He's the person when you're watching the movie. Where you're, and part of it is because he has the best part. He has the most complicated part. The, 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 the guy, you're like, what's going on with this guy? What's wrong with him? Why is he like this? I think that's a crock of shit. <laughs> <laughs> We're afraid just the opposite is true. Alex died for most of us a long time ago. Fucking ow. Tough, tough. one. Uh, this movie made... Is that what you say about Zach Lowe? <laughs> 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 Zach Lowe, why did he take one? <laughs> he's not here with us now, you know? That's true. He, wait, he's here spiritually. Okay. Eight million dollar budget. It made fifty six point four million dollars, and got two and a half stars from our guy Raj. He did got super not love artsy, it. fartsy, no, and snotty on us. He, it, this is one of his best kickers. You want to do it? Yeah, I gotta pull, pull it up. Hold on. I he's it's a, a, mostly a positive review. It's yeah. It's I think weird. It, he got the movie. I gotta say, I think it hit a little too close to home for oh, Raj. Oh, I really do. That's that's. That makes sense. The Big Chill is a splendid technical exercise. It has all the right moves. It knows all the right words. Its characters have all the right clothes, expressions, fears, lusts, and ambitions, but there's no payoff, and it doesn't lead anywhere. I thought at first that was a weakness of the movie. There is also the possibility that it's the movie's message. I I, I think he's right. I think that that's a great yeah. reading. I Four think stars. Understands that's weird it. that he gives it two. It is yeah. weird. It feels like a three or three and a half star review. I think he looked in the mirror, and he didn't like what he saw after this movie. Could be. He's I like, was going to change the world, and instead I sit in my room and I write about movies. Yeah, I'm talking to Cisco about whether 48 hours is a thumbs up or not. <laughs> what happened to me? Get my, my V-neck sweater on. <laughs> I mean, yeah. Wondering what happened with modern problems <laughs> with Chevy you, Chase. Do you feel that way right now? About what? About the emptiness of the movie? No, about yourself. Oh, CR's super happy. You and Cisco. Oh, CR touches, you know? touches lives every day. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's right. You, don't, you, you refuse to answer that question? If See, I'm happy? That's, no, that's not what I said. Like, do you feel that you have betrayed the hope I don't that you had that for I your life? I ever had a like um, political agenda in my early life that I have betrayed. Do you? Sierra and I were the same. <laughs> okay. We we would have been psyched to do what we like to do for a living and mm -hmm. make fifty k a year. <laughs> I think it would have been like. There's no way great. that's true about you. What are you talking about? No, that about? was true. I really just wanted to have a sports calm and get paid for it. No, and you're then the that, most as, competitive person I've that, ever met. But that eventually came as it went. That was but the, the initially I was like, how do I get paid to write columns? But part of the reason that you're so good is because you want to win and you well, won't that, let yourself that, quit without that winning. That manifested itself after. I admire it. Don't get me initially, wrong. Initially. And you too. You, I do you it play it cool, but with people, I know. Sierra yeah. and I had a whole, <laughs> we had all mid-90s, we didn't even know each other, but we would have been friends, but we had all mid-90s cigarette, cigarette stage. Yeah. Just like I probably maybe it was, was a late little 90s bit for you. Troy from Reality Bites for your tastes at points. The in Philly my life. thing I think would have been, been a problem. There would have been a Dr. J thing. With and this. I don't mean Troy like looks wise. I just mean I think I was pretty like intellectually full of myself. Yeah, I'm, I'm still dealing with that. With my intellectual full of myself. No, <laughs> no, no. My own, my own. What about you? Do you feel like you abandon any kind of like? I never really had any good ideas about how to change the world. So no, I don't. I'm very, I'm, I'm, I'm very, very excited didn't. about uh, what my life has become. Honestly, can I read you? Can I read you a paragraph of Pauline Kale's review? As soon as you see how warm she is, meaning uh, meaning um, Meg, I think, you begin to see the film's flabby side, 
The seven characters are like a psych major sexually integrated version of a 40s bomber crew. She's an incredible writer. <laughs> she really is a great, like one of the great writers of all time. She didn't really like this, this movie was made that much in the either. lab to like piss her off. Turn her off, yeah. yeah, for sure. Well, this became a pretty polarizing movie. Yeah. yeah. Even for as successful as it was, I also think it hit one of those things where it's like, well, wait, it shouldn't be this successful. And then there's the Sakaka 7 piece, yeah. which people are like, oh, it ripped off. Kasdan said, I never saw that movie. Um, I actually watched the first 30 minutes of it last night. Mm-hmm. Because it's on AMC Plus, mm-hmm. which I might be the only subscriber of, I got but they have really too. good movies. I'm in there. Three yeah. way. Multiple. Plus, like, you know, Daryl Dixon starting. Because that's how I get my Shudder subscription. Same. Yeah, 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 me as well. Yeah. I like AMC Plus. Um, I watched Dixon. the first 30 minutes, and it's like, you can't even compare they're very the different. two movies. Yeah, they're, they're very different. different. They, but there's like, I think it's the generation is the same. Sure. Yeah. The, it's, to me, the, the, the acting isn't even close. It, there's no technical savvy with how it's filmed. I think John Sills made it's that like movie an indie for movie. Like yeah, made, it's, it's like an old low school, budget movie. No the, money movie. But to me, they're they're actually quite useful to talk about with each other because Sakaka Seven is about people who didn't become yuppies. You know, the, yeah. the people who were the revolutionaries are not like cushy sitting on their ass executives, and they're not lawyers like. They're regular people. They're mid- lower middle class people. And that's what all, m- almost all of John Sales' movies are about, lower middle class people. That's what he's interested in. And this is the opposite. This is Lawrence Kasdan, after writing a Star Wars movie, thinking about what his life is now yeah. and where he came from. Two Star Wars movies. Right. And then trying to kind and of And Raiders of the Lost Ark his success. was involved in that one too. Yeah, yeah. And Body Heat. Solid start to yeah. the career for Larry. An unbelievable Kasdan. first five years, like maybe the single greatest in screenwriting history. But you know what's funny? In real life, there were more of the Sakaka Seven type people, like my dad, who obviously was in college in the late '60s and had a bunch of friends and a bunch of people in Boston. And was your dad in the Weather Underground? <laughs> I don't know about that, uh, but knew definitely had a couple of those people who, like, they never kind of graduated out yeah. of. They never unlocked the part of. Oh, now I'm forty. It would be nice to. It was kind maybe of maybe have money to it spend. It was not uncommon. Did you guys have anybody, maybe like friends' dads? I had, I had one friend's dad who was a pretty successful guy, but had habits from this late sixties era that he did not break. Like first of all, just listen to the Dead and the Almonds all the yeah. time. Mm. Smoke joints openly in front yeah. of me as a t- child, mm-hmm. like while we would drive us back and forth from like tennis camp or something. <laughs> And was like a real like I think ex hippie like had like a little bit of like a hard bitten. You saw my dad two weeks ago. Yeah. He has the same haircut he had in nineteen seventy. He loves the equalizer. <laughs> yeah, true. Yeah. He's, he's graduated. Where he's, he's grown with Denzel Washington. Yeah, I I don't know. My dad just made a big life change. Obviously, when he became a police officer. So whatever he was before that, kind of you can't live the same way. Yeah. Um, my mom, though, I don't know. My mom went to Woodstock. My mom was a flower child. Like, yeah. my mom, and she was always that kind of a person her entire life. She wasn't smoking weed in front of me, but she wasn't not smoking weed, you know? Like, mm-hmm. so I I feel like I understand a lot of who these people are, even though they're trying to, you know, abandon some of the way that they lived when they were 19 years old. My mom's take was, basically, she was amorphous. She, she moved with the era. Mm-hmm. So when we went into the disco party yeah. cocaine era, she's like... I'm in here. Yeah, I'm yeah. Keith Beckinsale. Like, it's the '80s. Stuff. We're now in the Gordon Gecko era. She's like, okay, yeah, yeah, oh, let's yeah, roll yeah, with yeah, this. Yeah. And then the '90s, it's like America, a little happier. She's like, cool. I'm gonna work <laughs> yeah. in a jewelry store. And uh, she just kind of rolled with whatever was going but she on. She loves this movie. It's her favorite movie. It's okay. her favorite normal movie. I should say. What does that mean? What do you mean? Like, what is a what's a not normal movie? You mean like nine and a half weeks? Oh and, yeah, or right. revenge? These, like yeah, every yeah. Adrian Line movie. Yeah. Okay. And people like yeah, Breathless with Richard Gere. Okay. Yeah. Movies where people are unfaithful with Diane Lane. Being sexy in a violent way or violent in a sexy way. Or, or there's somebody's got a secret or yeah. Okay. This is her most normal. I'm really proud of her that this is her <laughs> favorite <laughs> normal movie. Most rewatchable scene. We mentioned the opening credits with the bathtub and Marvin Gaye. And uh it's in the short list of great meet every character montage. So I tried to watch it. I know. Th- I knew when I was watching it this time, I was like, okay, you remember how much you love the opening 20 minutes of this. I tried to just write down what you learn with no dialogue from this. Like, you learn Alex committed suicide. You learn Sam is famous. You know Nick is stoned and 
probably yeah. bad news. Like you can tell based on where they sit with each other mm-hmm. at the church and how they like wave. You know to each what, other. Joe Beth Williams just from her sweater. She's yeah. like, oh, you're like a country club mom. Yeah, yeah. And it's just like that's all like within the story. It's still moving forward. It's still going towards this funeral, but you find out about all these people and the kind of like mapping of their relationships just by like watching this opening 20 minutes that's mm-hmm. largely without dialogue mm-hmm. where the dialogue is kind of ambient where it's like oh sit next to chloe and he's like oh i got this you know mm-hmm. you're like oh michael's piece of shit costner we you're- don't know when we see this movie that kevin costner we know nothing about him i didn't know who kevin costner was until american flyers which is a movie like Either the feed will just die of natural causes or there will be some last year where we're doing like American Flyers. And I'm <laughs> right. super happy. Yeah. Because I fucking love American Flyers. I've never seen it. Bicycle oh, movie. Awesome. Yeah. Costner's incredible it. in it. It was yeah. like he was clearly going to be a star after American Flyers. But, Maybe we um, should do Cycling Month on the rewatch. Yeah, breaking cycling Away. Be great. When are we doing Breaking Away? American Flyer. Is there, it's too bad Easy Rider's yeah, what's not the watchable. One rad what's, the BMX no, what's the one where Kevin Bacon is the uh, Quicksilver? Quicksilver. Quicksilver. Yeah, that's not great either. <laughs> Um, Breaking Away is a must for the rewatchables, though. That's an amazing movie. I agree. Okay. Costner in 87 hits with No Way Out, and then by the late 80s is one of the biggest stars in the world. And then that adds to the Big Chill's legacy. He's like, he got cut out of the Big Chill. You should explain it. Like, yeah, uh, I don't think, yeah. People may not know really like what happened. So he's the dead guy in the beginning. He's Alex. And he has this whole scene that they filmed that's the last 10 minutes of the movie where they go back in time, a little like the end of, uh, Godfather, Godfather 2. So yeah. it was supposed to be the last scene. Godfather 1 or Godfather, Godfather, two. Godfather 2? Yeah. yeah. Supposed to be the last scene going backwards in time with them in college and you see how important Alex was to the group dynamic. It doesn't work. And Kasdan's like, I got to cut Costner. Like, that. there's no other way to work him in the movie. Puts He's him out. in Silverado. Feels like bad. A, puts good, him in yeah. Silverado. Right, basically gives him the lead part in Silverado. It's like, we're good. This will all work out for you. And then over the years, as Costner became the biggest star from this movie... Then it became a case of how do we how do we see that Costner scene? And Kasdan, to his credit, always sat on it. Unlike who was the director we were just talking about who's doing cut recuts of Michael Mann. Black Michael Black Mann. Hat. Yeah. Michael Mann. They, I'm they, doing recuts. <laughs> <laughs> and Kasdan, out there. <laughs> Kasdan, which I think is the better way to do it. And Kasdan's just like, look, I made that movie. That's the movie. Nobody's going to see the Coster scene because it'll screw up what you see of the movie. And that's how we're doing it turns this. Turns out when you write Raiders, you can get a little cocky. You can I like, like yeah, it. <laughs> well, I mean, this movie hit in a way that Black Hat did not hit, unfortunately, for Black Hat. It remains Good to be seen. Uh, maybe over time, <laughs> uh, Michael Mann will be proven right. But that's the thing, too, is this movie was a zeitgeist movie. And then it became definitional for a generation. And yeah. because of that, he had no reason to mess with it. Why would you? What would you change about it? It's it was also if you, if you if you were like it's the 40th anniversary here's the Blu-ray the Costner scene is in there and Costner is going to do press for it I think it's it I really, think after 40 years maybe it is time to drop the Costner I think it really you think does it's like the JFK papers and when everybody dies like we'll get the Costner scene well now it can't live up that's the other thing is yeah. that it can't yeah live it's going to be if he felt it didn't work 40 years ago it's going to be disappointing I remember seeing the deleted scenes from Shawshank which I don't even know are even if they're out there anymore, but that one scene where the extended of red once he got out mm. and it's like an extra four minutes of him like leering at some girl with the tank top on and stuff. I'm just like, oh my God, I wish, why did, why, that's why Kasdan doesn't want to do this. So the reason why I double checked about it being the last scene in the movie is because I'm pretty sure it was the first scene they shot because they basically they did. You're right. Mm-hmm. And like put together like this whole like Thanksgiving scene and you have to imagine Getting to act with Alex, getting to act with the Alex character gave them like Probably this helped. kind of yeah, like good point. sort of orientation of like talking about this guy is more than just a figment of their imagination. Like they had worked with Costner. They were like had a visualization of who he was. It's a very good call. I agree. Well, we'll never see it because Lawrence Kasdan's made more money than anybody. And he's like, fuck you. You're not seeing it. Give him credit. I mean, he's a true artist. Like you got to be a, you got to really stick to your guns. What if would you're you like, do if you were, would you be would a cave. deleted scenes guy? Yeah, I probably would cave. Yeah, because like, oh, look at look at all the stuff I did. I'm a real show my work kind of guy. Yeah, know? but you're also a DVD head. You want to give people reason to buy physical That's true. media. That's true. Sean's like, I'm gonna check with my letterbox community, <laughs> find out what they think. Dude, can you can you create a letterbox category for this show? For any time uh, I appear, I think we need to speak directly to the audience. Let me see what the box heads think. Did I tell you that I met the the co-founder of Letterbox? And he did he he, uh, he said he heard your comments. 
Um, he he said, thought like they were funny. Okay, great. Um, next scene. I mean, we go from banger to banger here. I do think, in- incidentally, like which character would have a very active letterboxed account is a great <laughs> award to give. <laughs> oh, that has got to be one. Michael. I mean, yeah, Michael oh, yeah. would be. He'd be like super, yeah. super douchey with the movie picks. William Hurt shows up late as we're doing this. The the that that whole the whole wake scene. Where did Alex's hope go? Klein goes up, does the speech, Bombs. can't get through it. Yeah. But he does get off the, there was always something about Alex that was too good for this world. Then he dies. Um, the stones come in. Just the way the camera moves around. And then they fucking kick into that song. And it's one of the best stone songs. Yep. And it's hard not to hear that song and think of this movie. But it's great. It's diegetic. It's like Karen starts playing it on organ. So you're like, okay. Great and stuff. then it just kicks in. And there's a lot of like funny little stuff. Like, like, uh. Chloe. Joe Beth Williams is introducing her husband to William Hurt. He's like, can I go over here? She's yeah. trying to get away from <laughs> yeah, him. Richard's getting dunked on. Yeah. Uh, Meg gets stoned. She's out of her mind. We get the, what was the argument about? I told him he was wasting his life. Um, all that stuff. So Chloe's saying, I wish I could have r- ridden up there. Like, yeah, in the front. Yeah. Um, first 20 minutes, unassailable. Next uh, rewatchable scene, the Richard's big kitchen scene. I'm glad you pointed this out. Richard's on a fucking heater in there, making a sandwich at three in the morning, just dropping dimes. It, 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 a really weirdly resonant scene from these two guys who are like lapsed revolutionaries and this yeah. one other guy who's like a real kind of down the middle square conservative guy, but who's kind of being honest. Yeah. I, I just it, also like, I didn't really think about this before, but like, can you imagine if... Uh, if like you were eating a sandwich in the middle of the night and I walked in like high out of my mind and my boy had his shirt open and we were just like, we're hungry. What's up, Rich? <laughs> but he is fearless in being like, here are the decisions I made in yeah. life. It's not exactly what I thought it was going to be. I have some regrets, but nobody said I was supposed to be happy. Yeah. Like, and he, nobody gives a says, shit about it. It's complete yeah. strangers. Yeah. He's saying that. He says, uh, he says, you set your priorities. That's the way life is. I wonder if your friend Alex knew that. One thing's for sure, he couldn't live with it. I know I shouldn't talk. You guys knew him. But the thing is, nobody said it was going to be fun. At least nobody said it to me. You and get the feel like, like he wants I'll to see say you guys that. Later. <laughs> he wants to say that to Karen. Yeah. Because she's yeah, been building yeah. these people up to him. And he's like, so these are the fucking jokers that you've been talking about. Like the greatest time of your life was with them. And like, they all look like losers or that no, nobody wants to have a conversation with me. Yeah. Well, he watched her zoning out there in JT Lancer episodes and yeah. he knew something, something bad was going on. <laughs> Does like, he though? Does he get it? Does he even really understand what's going on there? Yeah. Cause I think he, he pulls out at the like, beginning. Yeah, you're staying the weekend. Yeah. And he's like, fine, cheat on me. Like, no, I but I think he's mad, but he's like, what am I supposed to do? Like make you come home with me when like all your What would you are? do? If my wife was like, I want to stay here with Tom Berenger. Yeah. Um, there's a lot of what would I do in this movie that I would yeah. love to unpack. Yeah, yeah. We'll get it, I get that's coming up. <laughs> the uh I just wrote that in the next rewatchable scene as JT Lancer screening, dinner scene, cleanup, pot smoking. Yeah. Really good stretch. Yeah. I like when they're making fun of him about JT Lancer because that's like the most authentic what a friend group would do in this situation. You're yeah. just gonna like yeah, bust a person. Like mystery balls. science theater to like the opening credits of that. It's great. It's also like you must have had real fun making the JT Lancer credits. Oh God, it's perfect. It feels like it's a real show. The two chicks in the bed. He's just like, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and that is like what fucking TV used to be. It know? really was. <laughs> <laughs> well, this guy's this gonna have a night. <laughs> it's Wednesday night. <laughs> Coming up on ABC. <laughs> uh I like when Glenn Close does the he should be here. I feel like we should have had a chair for Alex. I feel like I was at the best when I was with you people. That's cool. <laughs> Great stuff. Um, is this the first extended Glenn Close opportunity you've had on the on on the rewatchable? Fatal Attraction, right? Fatal Attraction. Okay. Garp's going to happen at some point. I was thinking about Garp. Garp was because that's what she did right before this, right? I'm always worried with some of these that I like the movie more than maybe it's worthy to be on the feed but this then is, we do something like Black Hat and I'm like you know what maybe we can do Garp it resets the bar <laughs> <laughs> you know what Black Hat happened yeah. uh, this also has the did you just define how you can just keep lowering the bar for this yeah. podcast forever and, well, as long yeah. as he brings me in to be an ass yeah. as long as CR is excited like, about it um, let's do Shot Caller <laughs> I like when it's getting 
<laughs> when do you want to do that? It's really empty. <laughs> October? I, I do think we need to do prison December or something like that. Uh, prison December? Yeah. Yeah. Could we do lock up with Sly Stallone? Of course. That sounds great. <laughs> I like when it gets super poignant and Nick says, I know what Alex would say, what's for dessert? And nobody laughs, but Chloe thinks it's like the funniest yeah. thing ever. Yeah. This is really good. Uh, good music in this too. Leading to CR's favorite scene when uh, Nick gets Glenn Close's character coked up. Yeah. Well, I just really like Harold being like, remind me to get you more cocaine tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> right. Uh, w- so I just wanted to talk through very quickly Nick removing the cocaine from his car. Yeah. Um, yeah. Which is definitely something that I did not understand like the first five times I watched this yeah, in like 1994. But, <laughs> but, yeah, right. <laughs> but now upon reflection, I realized. So he was transporting. He has drugs in his like wheel well. Yeah. Right. But he had like a kilo I think it's a, yeah, it's a lot. I think he had a bunch of, I had this in uh, Unanswerable Questions. We could do it now. I think he had a whole bunch of drugs. Yeah. That he was driving around with for whatever reason. Was it meant for distribution or was it meant for I think party both. time? Or? I think both. I think he does a little bit of both. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I think it's like, this is going to be fun to do a lot of this. He's very reckless with his pills. Truly. I mean, he's just yeah. kind of like, oh, just, oh well, lost right a few of, of those. Yeah, yeah. And they went down the, do you have this seat. as Apex Mountain for Quaaludes or no? <laughs> No, Ludes is, is Wolf of Wall Wolf Street. Wall Street. Okay. <laughs> Lemon Ludes. Yeah. Yeah. The Michigan football game, I just enjoy it. It's not even that great of a scene, but I just like, I just, this is totally what would happen with all these people. Like, oh my God, the game's on. Like, yeah. the Alex is it's just It's funny, whatever. it's also, they're all just like complete addicts for it. Like, yeah. no matter where they come in their life, they're just like yelling about Bo Schembechler. Yeah. I'll get yeah, back to you in the third quarter too. I love Megan, Michael. The, uh, the Alex recon with the big argument which we talked about. Wise up, folks. We're all alone out there. He was classier than that when Nick's basically explaining why he didn't leave the uh, thing. And then Behringer and Hurt just fucking go at it. I don't care what you say. I know I loved you and everyone else here. I'll go on believing that till I kick. And then Joe Beth Williams comes in with the, what's the matter with you? What happened to you? <laughs> just good stuff. That, that scene's just elite. Yeah. Where are you at on Joe Beth? You want to do this now? I, I'd like to know your take. I really like her in this movie. Super pro. This is a great era for her. And I, as well. I bought I bought stock and everything. Mm-hmm. And then she was in like teachers and then it just kind of never totally happened for her. Kramer versus Kramer, poltergeist, big chill. Yeah. Good run. Yeah. Really nice run. But it feels like the next move should have been LA Law. Like a okay. like that a would network have been drama. A, but that would have been like a a downgrade for movie stars at that time like if you were in well, I'm saying in retrospect right you bang out those movies and then you you hook up with like Steven Bochco right. and you become the lead actress in a show right she never was gonna get to Kathleen Turner Diane yeah Keaton, you just get you know, replaced that. by the next yeah. whoever yeah. Um, I like her too she's well cast in this the ending as I said I love when Nick hugs Sam oh Nick hugs I screwed that up Nick hugs Sam not vice versa um, and then you can reach Nick here for a while. Yeah. Oh, Nick's going to be in the guest house Do you think the ending now. is a little abrupt? It definitely is. But I, I think it's intentional. I, the ending always bothered me, especially when this was on HBO for 10 straight years. But I think that's the point is it's that like, there is no ending. It is really like fuck fest and then breakfast and they're like the credits roll during breakfast. And you're like, do you guys don't want to talk about anything here? Like, well, we know, we now know that there are 10 minutes that have been excised from the sure. end of the movie. I mean, the movie is supposed to end on this reflection on what it all meant. And now it's not there anymore. So it does feel, it feels a little bit sitcom Yeah. You know, like, it's like we wrap this up with like one one liner. Right. Yeah. I mean, after you've just recreated the 1984 NBA finals. <laughs> even, oh, wait, I'm, I'm getting my project screwed up. My bad. <laughs> uh, what's your most rewatchable scene? Uh, it's the opening 20 minutes. I'm saying. I'm just going to go yeah, with that. Me too. The can't always get what you want and hurt it through the grapevine. I have a new category before we get to what's age the best. The Coked Out Glenn Close Award for Best Use of Cocaine. I'm just adding to the rewatchables anytime there's cocaine. Um, uh, right here, it's is for- Is she coked out when she's crying in the shower? No. No, she gets the coked day before. Out it's when the, she's lying in bed and she's like oh, off right. fidgety. And right. she's like, okay. you're telling everybody about the stock deal. Yeah, why are you telling? <laughs> and Michael, what's he up to? And yeah, she's, she's just- She's like kneading the sheets. And he and keeps shit. rolling okay. over and then she goes to the other side. It's, it's I really good like, cocaine stuff. I need to go stuff. on the roof. Like, yeah. I, I'm not going to be like sleeping next to you while this is happening. Great stuff. Glenn Close has ever actually used cocaine? Mm. Uh, I lived the that's the 80s. To suggest that Everyone's she a suspect because she was Slanders. an actress in the 80s. Oh, <laughs> interesting. Okay. What's age the best? 
JT Lancer was just fucking brilliant. It's so good. It's a great idea. It's perfect. Yeah. Because it wasn't just Magnum P.I. back then. We also had Matt Houston. And who was the Hooker, Mag- right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, Magnum P.I. ripoff guy. I loved him on Us Weekly. I, I thought him in the airplane, all that stuff. Do you think I, that Behringer is the most forgotten major star of the 1980s? Yeah. Because I think for men, yeah. The guy was you consider in, Ryan O'Neill more like 70s, 70s right? 70s, yeah. He was in monster movies. I mean, he was Huge. the lead of a Ridley Scott movie. He yeah. was in Platoon, which was Academy one of the Award big nominated. movies in the He's the major decade. league. He was in yeah, Major League. Yeah. They had an awesome yeah. career. Then he moved into a really nice five o'clocker stage. Yeah, sniper. Just making a yeah. bunch of action movies. What, was he in The Substitute? Yeah. 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 It's a solid movie. Yeah. What happened? What's up with that? And then he's he was in a he was in one Nolan movie, right? He's in Inception. Inception. Right. Yeah. He's been in some stuff in the last 20 years, but, and you know, I always say like, he looks just like my dad. Like that's how my dad looks. So it's always weird whenever I see him in a movie. Someone to watch over me is another one that we'll know we'll scrape in the barrel when we do that one. It's really not good. It's I, not I, good, I but I really enjoyed it. I really enjoyed it a couple years ago. I love Mimi Rogers. I do too. I really was watching it and I was like, you know what? This last be a half hour classic. just dies. Yeah. It's got the, our guy from The Fugitive though, the one armed man. Oh yeah. He's the, he's the bad guy. Typecast. I like the Michael, the People Magazine, all the People Magazine jokes. Yeah. The, it's how you got to finish finish the article during a crap. That's our rule. And just like the 19 drive-bys on People Magazine are really funny. Did that inspire any of the sports guy column thinking? You know, like I got to, what, what length should this be? Yeah, I was going for longer dumps. Okay, okay. I, I wanted like a nice 15 minute, <laughs> clear it out. Yeah. Uh, I thought that can't believe it, his funeral and she's stoned and then... Meg's like, yeah. Hey, <laughs> Meg's great. wandering into a field. Yeah. Want to do Meg now? Want to talk about Meg? Sure. One of the great As movie character? characters of yeah. the 1980s. Yeah. yeah. Professional woman, early professional early 80s woman. Yeah. Who their clock's ticking. This seemed like a character that just started to pop up in the 80s that ever was completely ignored in the 70s, right? Yeah. Um, kind of peaks with baby boom, right? She's good. Make I have some place. recasting couch thoughts later. I'm very not with you on this. Okay. Well, I'll make I, my I really case later. Cast. I really like And Mary I think Kay it's place. interesting also not to jump on other categories that Joe Beth and Glenn Close both wanted to play this part. Mm. Yeah. I think they were like, this is the best part. It is a really interesting character. Feels real. There are definitely people in the world right now that are like this. Um, and I, I, I've always been a big Mary Kay Place fan. I like her a lot. So I this think is something I don't see a lot of that much anymore, but was a definite thing. Of like the girl who would like kind of like sidle up next to somebody else's boyfriend and just be like, we're just friends. Yeah. But like it would be like kind of awkward. And she kind of does that a couple of times in this movie. But he I was puts like, her put his feet on her at one point. Yeah. And, she's and it's doing like, oh, foot this is rubs. Cool foreshadowing. Like, and it's, she's is... like wearing Sarah's bathrobe and she's like, This is my bathrobe now. And it's like, oh, okay. But then Sarah's it, like it turns out to be justified in a way yeah. because of how this yeah. all takes place. I mean, this is also a different we weren't raised with the free love era. We you weren't. Know? This is a different time. I like uh, when Sam says, for what's age the best, in LA, I don't know who to trust. I don't know why they like me or even if they do like me. And Harold says, well, you don't have that problem here. You know, I don't like do you. Do you feel that way about LA? No, I just like the Kevin Klein. Kevin Klein gets off like five really good, like deadpan Kevin Klein jokes. He's fucking elite. Incredible. What an actor. I mean, that's there's a reason he became the president. Yeah. I feel like he didn't, even have the career he should have had and he still had one of the best I agree. careers. Like he's just I don't think terrific. he wanted to have a career like that. Yeah. But he easily could have been I don't know. I, there's like all kinds of things he could have He could have been Tom Hanks. I mean he just didn't he yeah. could have pursued that career. Absolutely could have been yeah. Tom Hanks. It's a good call. I would have wanted to be on an island with him yeah. trying to figure out how to take my tooth out with ice skates. Yeah. Richard and Karen's marriage for what's age the best? Should we push the beds together? Why? Okay, how about further apart? Great stuff. <laughs> <laughs> uh Sarah talking to her kids when she's using the mom voice, Glenn Close. And then she's like, sometimes I don't believe what I hear myself saying. Yeah, because I'm That always mother. resonated with me once I had kids. You're like, I've become this different person when I talk to my kids. Man, You're probably doing it now. It. I'm going through okay, it. Okay, young lady. Yeah. You'll go to bed at nine o'clock or that's it. <laughs> don't make me repeat myself as one that I'm starting yeah. to use, which is tough. It's tough. <laughs> What's age the best? Nick's Porsche. Oh 1972, 9-11, Targa. Yeah. Yeah. What's up with the paint job on also, that Also, he like... It's like Matt. It's, or just rust. Yeah. And then he basically... I love how he parks at the funeral 
where he essentially just like kills the engine <laughs> yeah. and then turns on the parking brake yeah. but parks diagonally. Yeah. And you're like it's almost like that car could not have made it another ten feet. <laughs> Crazy car. I just I I don't think that car would be drivable now. No. You'd really have to like you'd have to spend months restoring it. That was like the end of an era where you drive that car now and the whole thing's shaking. I like two quotes. Amazing tradition. They throw a great party for you on the one day they know you can't come. And then I haven't met that many happy people in my life. How do they act? Yeah. Mick Tilly says that. I always thought that was a good one. Um, what else do you have? Any any what's age the best CR other than the soundtrack? Uh yeah, a couple. One is the arc of a friend's getaway weekend is perfectly broken down in this movie where it goes from awkward, like, ah, we're we're all here. We all drove over here, we made it, to awesome and that's the night that you're like let's move here let's yeah. all move here together <laughs> then something bad happens this the last night where it's like uh shit she had too many and now we're fighting <laughs> you're now in the fourth quarter of this trip and then everybody leaves yeah <laughs> yeah it's and it's just like perfectly broken down in yeah. that 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 part of it is very <laughs> relatable for sure um i also feel like this has aged well as one of the signature serious comedies of the 1980s mm. there was this like wave of movies mm -hmm. in this decade tootsie big chill lost in america pritzy's honor baby boom broadcast news funny movies but they're all about this really important stuff in life yeah and this kind of existential city crisis. slickers even like city that. slickers yeah. like that working girl parenthood you know there's a bunch of movies that are like this and boy we don't have those anymore like, we really don't have those anymore. Yeah, like soft-hearted but funny dramedy. Now know? we yeah. have the adults with Michael Sarah. <laughs> um, what? <laughs> What's that? It's, a, movie it's that a new movie that Mumblecore. Mumblecore. That I Michael seen. Sarah's trying to bring Mumblecore back. I had a couple of other things I thought were pretty cool. Pretty, pretty... What do you got? Uh, I got Nick's hog not working. I thought that was always pretty cool. <laughs> You thought that was cool. Yeah, it's a good like throw <laughs> war injury. Like, call back to some Richard Arthur Ford Rises. stuff. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know. Uh, but they don't make a big deal about Vietnam. It's just like yeah. Nick got his nuts blown off over there. If you don't pay attention, you kind of miss it. Yeah, yeah. Um, and also just the Nick character being Alex's ghost, and like basically being like the things that Alex kind of believed in, and Chloe obviously recognizing that and being like, "You're just like him." and I, I really like this idea that he's sort of moving through the house and while they're all talking about Alex, he's like, you didn't fucking know Alex, you know? They do a good job of not playing the Alex card too much and anytime it's played, it's perfect. Uh, one more would say the best for me is they use the great Santini house. Mm. Oh, yeah. That's that's one of those. Tom like, Berenger liked it so much he got married there. Here, Chris is moving back to the Carolinas. He bought the <laughs> Santini house. Here, Chris is moving to Singapore. He bought the Black Hat house. <laughs> <laughs> I also really like the one of the things that he's the best. It's not a rewatchable scene level, but uh, Nick and Sam just watching TV together is is great. I wish there were more scenes of just guys watching TV. You're so analytical. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> what's, the, what's what's going on? I don't know. Who's those, that? I'm not sure. <laughs> those three guys are so good together. Like you could have. I mean, this easily could have been an eight episode something. And and why do you gotta say that? Why do you gotta say that? No, I'm just saying I would have wanted to spend more time with them. Yeah. Even when they're in that running scene, when it's the three of them are like, I could do this for 20 more minutes. Is the, it the four handsomest guys ever in a role in a set of roles like that? Yeah, and Goldblum supposedly the, but I think the it's skeevy like, one. And when you look at like guys that age now, is like Chris Evans. And it's like, right. It's like when you look at William Hurt, you're like, he's Chris Evans' age. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's crazy. Right? Yeah, he seems like a man. But William Hurt, Barringer, Klein, Goldblum is the dork, and he's like 6'8. Yeah. Yeah. And Kevin Costner, supposed to be Kevin Costner. Oh my God. Goldblum's also the best route runner of all of them. That's a good point. That's a good point. <laughs> he's got great hands, too. Big Kahuna Burger, best use of food and drink. The use of coffee in this movie is elite. Mm the coffee pot, people going the way they yeah. just, all of it. It's the just really great coffee. Convene around it, yeah. Then he's, then at these Benihana Awards, scene still in location, it's got to be the house. The uh, Great Shot Order Award has to be the... Can you, you got to stop here for us. Has to be Costner, right? Can Sean and I just do something real quick with yeah. Great Shot Gordo? Yeah. Uh, so John Bailey, who shot this movie, is an incredibly, you know, ta uh, legendary cinematographer, and he gave this really great interview where he talked about like, you know, Kazin largely like turned over some of the filmmaking stuff to him. And so they, and this is a movie that's basically like a 90 minute dramedy and they're referencing 
the Japanese filmmaker Ozu in like some of the shots that they do. So when you see like three shots of objects that all tell you something about characters, it's like this thing called a triad, right? I think I'm getting this right. I'm not the biggest Ozu expert, but it's really awesome. Like the level of care that they put into it. And another one is like they were shooting the field outside the church where they see all the rows of like farmland. And he's like, oh, my God, this matches perfectly with the stitches on Alex's wrist. So if you see the dissolve from Alex's wrist, it goes perfectly into this field. Jesus. Yeah, it's just like shit like that. It's like you don't have to make it that good. But when you do, it's why it comes around, you know, every 40 years. I think also when you see the main people who worked on actually making the movie, it's not dissimilar from the people who are on screen. So the editor of the movie is Carol Littleton, who edited E.T., and of course, Kasdan was helped along by Spielberg in many ways. Kara Littleton was mar- is married to John Bailey, the mm-hmm. cinematographer. So the editor and the cinematographer of the film are married. So they are able to talk when they're not working together about how to work on this movie to make it work. So when you watch a movie like this, which basically just takes place in a house. But if you look at how the camera's moving, like very subtle zooms, panning very purposefully around, like it seems perfunctory but if you pay close attention it's really purposeful and you just gotta have a lot of people that trust each other to make something good like this Mm. yeah that's something that i think really is underrated about it yeah they do a great job with space and people in the shot you always know who's where yeah you have those dialogue scenes where you got seven people but it always feels like everything's connected yeah i also uh, just love like when they're doing those insert shots of like what people bring with them on trips like Six pairs of jockey shorts yeah. and rubbers. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, he does. I mean, he made a whole movie about this cast. And the accidental tourist yeah. is like an entire movie of insert shots. And what do people carry with them when they go on trips? You yeah. Know? All right. The Butch's Girlfriend Award, weak link of the film. Karen going back to Richard at the end never sat right to me. Like fucking JT Lancer is just going at it with her in the in the field. Yeah. yeah. So next day she wakes up. She's like. Can't wait to take the boys and Richard to come see a taping. That's going to be so much fun. And it's like, what's going on here? Do but, you think that she doesn't stay with, she doesn't like say, like, hey, I'm going to leave Richard for JT Lancer is because of the conversation we ha- she has with Sarah about the, her Alex affair. And she's like somehow like consummating this relationship with this guy only made it so that we were no longer friends and I was in like a hole with my husband basically. Yeah. So even though she does it, She's like, I'm not going to leave my life for this guy and then have that not work out and then lose my family in the process. Yeah, I think I think that definitely informs it. But it's also like this is something that you see married women just want to like have an adventure and feel like they can still be that person if they want to be, but are not really willing to give up all the other things that they've built their life towards. So I, it makes sense to me as a character choice. I'll, I mean, you know, she got the Lance from Lancer. Like she got it. It's all good. She <laughs> he, he the list. It up. Yeah. <laughs> JT fucking Lancer. Yeah. He rolled over and he was like, two thumbs up, baby. I never loved it. This week on Lancer, (laughs) JT takes down a housewife. (laughs) And takes down a cartel. (laughs) ABC 830. What's age the worst? Glenn Close's haircut in this movie is not just my favorite. Absolute affront hairstyles. I usually it's just awful. Defend. Chris Everett had the same haircut in Wimbledon right around this time, and I don't, I can't explain it. I don't know why this became a haircut that women were getting. I know it's gone now; it'll never come back. Mm-hmm. Would you rather have the Kevin Costner scene? Or have somebody digitally insert better hairstyles <laughs> on these people. <laughs> Behringer's hair is incredible. Yeah, Behringer's great. Behringer's whole look is phenomenal. It's great. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Mary Kay places hair is, and I can't say it's awesome either. I can't believe I didn't realize this was going to become the Lancer pod. I should have known. <laughs> <Lancer. laughs> it's your favorite episode of if Lancer. If I texted you one night, I was like, I found cast and put 25 minutes of JT yeah, Lancer as as footage. If it was Tarantino, he would have been like, I've written two seasons <laughs> of JT Lancer. <laughs> we filmed the pilot. Uh, what stage the worst? I'm opening a club like Elaine's, but hipper. Elaine's I think is Elaine's is, is still around, yeah. right? Uh, I think it is. I think it's closed now, but that's something that people were saying about Elaine's for 40 years. Yeah. Elaine's is dead now. What stage the worst? Return of the Secaucus 7. Just kind of hanging over this movie a little bit. It's, you know, it's a way to ding this movie. Who knows? The Big Chill was adapted for television as the short-lived series Hometown. 
Haven't seen it. Didn't know about this. Uh, it was like a 16 episode run in yeah. like 1986. You recapped it on Prestige, though. How was it? <laughs> it, was, yeah. it was good. Really, really found its voice. <laughs> Any other uh, what's aged? Yeah. Uh, I just think that we've probably medically moved past the idea of treating insomnia with a giant cold cut sandwich in the middle of the night. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sitting with two guys I haven't eat, seen eat solid food during the daytime <laughs> yeah. in like five years. So the idea of you guys taking down turkey sandwiches at 3.30 in the morning also. I would have been like, do you guys have some almonds? <laughs> Richard being like, sometimes I like to just sit downstairs quietly while my family sleeps. Is like, you're the BTK killer. <laughs> like, you know what I mean? <laughs> get, on, get on fucking Twitter or something. Do something with yourself. That's Fincher's movie is Richard just be just becomes a, yeah. the guy in Long Island, the also, little league murderer. I love I love smoking, but like I, I Meg smokes literally more than Carl Bernstein. She smokes fucking <laughs> everywhere. They're like folding clean laundry and she's like puffing. Yeah. She's like, I, I, I can't believe it. I can't keep a guy. She's fucking nicotine everywhere. <laughs> oh, hard to believe she couldn't hold one down. Was there a better title for this movie? No. It's a brilliant title. I love hearing him talk about yeah. why he titled it that. He said, the experience of cold adult reality after leaving the warm embrace of true friendship during college. You're fucking, this is why you're rich, Lawrence. So Kasdan. cool. He's so smart. The Kid Cudi Pursuit of Happiness Award for Best Needle Drop goes to the Rolling Stones song, but there's also five other songs. I get, I, that I, could I'm going to go with The Weight. Yeah. Yeah. I had that as a runner-up. Bad Moon Rising is good, too. I like Bad Moon Rising is good. Well, I mean, I feel like Ain't Too Proud to Beg and doing the dishes and cleaning up is the most the memorable one. one right? I just That's really the... like when like Meg's it's gotta be the stones, shattered though. and she's sitting at the dining room table smoking and like the shoe boxes are there mm -hmm. and the weight's playing. Yeah. yeah like, I like that you get one, the too. next cut and like some boxes are gone yeah. and some are in different spots. That's yeah. such a great song, And Karen's too. nagging her about whether she bangs Sam. Right, right. Well, you make me feel like a natural woman is a pretty big one, too. Uh, yeah. Are we ready to talk about that? Not yet. Okay. The Weight is one of those, a lot of the 60s songs, early 70s songs, haven't aged that great. Mm -hmm. Or they just feel kind of confined to that. That song, I feel like, is still yeah, it's really banging. What's the song that hasn't aged that great? Like, I Shot the Sheriff? <sighs> yeah, that's, oh. that's, a, that's a weird yeah, one. That was your anthem. I know, there's some... <laughs> The Stones catalog has some ones that I always felt like in the 80s, like that song's amazing. And now I listen yeah. to like them. what? I like Brown Sugar. Action? No, Brown Sugar. That's one oh. that's like, eh. Yeah. Also one of your faves, though. <laughs> Just for, only for the lyrical content. <laughs> Here's where we can do the sex scene. The Marilyn Rubin Award. Did this movie need a better sex scene? I think I'm good with. Kevin Klein just gently rocking in the missionary position on his <laughs> wife's best friend. <laughs> I don't know if I needed, I don't know if I needed the I cum I, shot I think at the end there. <laughs> <laughs> okay, gun to your head. Do you want the Costner scene? I can't believe you like made us wait and or wait and wait to address that scene and then you just blew it all, yeah. literally. She's also like dressed like she's in The Handmaid's Tale. Like, she's like, got like the full to, nightgown on. She's like it's a grandmother. Like, yeah, yeah. yeah. She's like, he's like, can you at least brush your teeth? You smoked 136 <laughs> cigarettes today. You're not even going to explain mouthwash. what, like, uh, so a lot of people listen to these pods and they've never seen the movie. Really? They, so, li they listen to the pod without knowing the movie? I, I know that for a fact. And th what happens in this movie might be the most interesting thing to talk about with your friends and spouse yes. that's ever happened in a movie. I already, so, I already, yes, I did that. You, of course you did. I brought up the list. It's, 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 so should we have talked about it sooner? Let's yeah. explain let's it. it. All right. Yeah. So were you going to put, I was going to put it in what's age the worst, I guess. I had it for picking nits. <laughs> But I got, <laughs> well, it's a pretty big nitpick. Um, all right, so what happens is Kevin Klein's character has an affair. Meg has shown up. She's like, I want to have a baby. My biological clock is ticking. I'm ovulating this weekend. And she goes through the whole house of guys being like, will you impregnate me? Right. Yeah. She starts with Nick. His, 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 his stuff don't work. Then she goes to Sam. He declines. JT Lancer's like, only if it could be a threesome. <laughs> Then she considers Michael, and then she thinks better of it. And at least Good one move. guy left, and that's the guy who owns the house. But who's she married. never asks Harold, and she Sarah offers up her husband. But she offers him up because she had an affair with Alex. That, you just, you, that was my Stephen A. Smith. It's just that that whole thing is just like her guilt. Oh, for sure. Yeah. I don't even think that's a hot take. What's I think a that's Stephen A. Smith? The hot take? What's your hot take on it? 
just that like that's loser behavior it's just like you're the one who cheated don't make him go now be a sperm donor and like that that's that's gonna make everything awkward mm. just because you're i think she was thinking kind of a now or even thing yeah yeah i think um, so i don't think that's a hot take though but you think it's a hot like, take that she like seduces him into doing it and like, i still feel like she wins though because she had sex with kevin costner and he's having sex with <laughs> meg the chain smoker <laughs> like it's just <laughs> like he, he's still a lot it's still a loss yeah uh, that's fair so it's the ultimate like put yourself in their shoes yeah, I, mean, I think that <laughs> no it's insane ivf it's insane. has gotten to the point and like you know they've yeah. made advances where it's like that shouldn't probably need to happen right okay i don't know i don't kids so maybe you tell but i me. think it's part of the point is these people were so close and this was the era and yeah there's a generosity and a free love it. my mom is like all in on it she was like totally makes sense i could see it I'm like cool <laughs> so that's the that is this the sas that's the take the take yeah. is this was actually a good move okay because harold good guy yeah successful man faithful husband good genes good sure. genes He's 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 down. Yeah. He's he's down to participate. He's wearing like full pajamas before it happens. Like I think he's a little nervous. Do you think he didn't he's enjoy like, it? This bed's always been lucky for Sarah and I. That's weird. <laughs> that was and weird. She, and she's wearing her mom's grandma <laughs> bathrobe. Mom's grandmother's bathrobe. I do. I think Kevin Klein is elite. But what do we think about his South Carolina accent? It goes. I had that in picking a little bit. Of times. I'll say, I'll say, yeah. this has been a good bed it's, for me it and comes Sarah. And goes. It's not. It's not a little awesome. Weird. Little weird. Not awesome. Um, it's one of the greatest scenes in movie history because it's so weird. When it's so, happening, you're like, what? Like when she goes in the room wearing the robe, the first time I saw it, I was like, there, what is it? I, I couldn't wrap my head around it. he's just like, this is the cradle of life here. This little twin bed that we've got. <laughs> <laughs> this, is, this is the fucking, the most fertile ground in South Carolina. Saturday Night Live, I tried to find it. They did a great sketch when oh, they yeah. had... Uh, I think Kevin Klein, either Kevin Klein was the host or Glenn, Cl Cl Glenn Close was the host, where they do this and they're just going at it in the bedroom and it's just going on and on, the room shaking. <laughs> yeah. And Glenn Close's character is getting madder and madder at that <laughs> it's going nuts. And finally she turns into Fatal Attraction. Right. Oh, that's, that's yeah. really that's it was a good, good five minute sketch. Um, Glenn Close's faces in this movie. <laughs> As her husband is railing her best friend in her bathrobe. <laughs> when she's like, that's right, we did it. Yeah. yeah. And she's just like, <laughs> and then afterwards, the next day, she goes and sees her in the in the bedroom and Mary Kay Place is rolling over with this, I was ovulating and, and Glenn Close is just smiling what? with this creepy, crazy <laughs> smile. Okay. Is it better or is it better if it worked and she got pregnant or is it better if it didn't work in, in Sarah's mind? Because what you ideally, if you're her, what you want, yeah, because she's pretty skeptical. She's like, Well, it doesn't always take the first time, right? Yeah, but so if it doesn't work, then you don't have to deal with your husband having a baby out there with you, your best friend, yeah, which was and, the Lancer's whole problem. He's like, I don't want a, a bunch of little JTs running around, right? Right, but I think the first time they get into a fight, Glenn Close and Kevin uh, Klein comes up immediately, why don't you go fuck your whore? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and then that's it. I'll give her the bathroom again, you fucking were, asshole. Were you quoting Connie from The Godfather there? I did. I kind of hit there a little Connie Corleone. Puff on cool, you. Um, it's a batshit crazy scene. My hottest take was, um, Sean, you're going to hate this. Oh, no. Why not a sequel instead of doing Grand Canyon? Let's bring him back for the 25th there's college. So, there's so much meat on the bone. I'm not a sequel guy normally, but I think this was so sequely. I think what happens is Meg's son comes for his piece of running dog shoes. <laughs> of, of running dog? And it's like Pacific Heights. He's like, I'm living, you know. <laughs> oh, so you're saying that he's grown up now. <laughs> yeah. And oh, it's I like, like this. The sperm donation from hell, you know? And he comes back and he's like, Oh, this is good. I'm it's like that John Travolta Vince Vaughn movie. And by movie. this point, Kevin Klein can be like in his 60s and be like, Oh, dude, Claire. <laughs> 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 that fateful night that I'm pregnated, man. Yeah, his accent's like strong Thurman yeah. through and through. Yeah, that's really good. I would I would have been fine with a 25th college reunion at at Michigan. Yeah, would have been great too. I like instead of Grand Canyon, I would have rather. Had it would have been sequel. nice to get their takes on the Harbaugh Harbaugh years. You know, <laughs> right? 
Or even I, I would have. Or, or Glenn Rice, how, how close they have, came. The, the fucking Fab Five. Yeah, Fab Five. Oh some, my God. Some Jalen Rose. Oh hot yeah, takes. they would have had Fab Five, and they would have had uh, Grandmama and Larry Johnson. You know, and the Hornets. You know, they would have had a lot, <laughs> a lot to look back on that they would have enjoyed. Harold's bastard kid is wearing the long baggy Jalen Rose That's shorts. That's right. <laughs> he Don't sends get him me, as Dad. A <laughs> Jawan Howard understands me. I'm going to go listen to Biggie. <laughs> Meg's dead of lung cancer. She's at 42. <laughs> <laughs> this orphan child. Uh, Harold won't take care of him. Cass, you didn't have a hottest take, did you? I already burned it, which is that the first five years of Kazdin's career is the greatest screenwriting run in movie history. Mm. Um, uh, it's Empire Strikes Back. Yeah. Raiders of the Lost Ark. Body Heat. He sells Continental Divide wow. to Steven Spielberg, which becomes not a very good movie, but yeah. apparently it was a good script. Return of the Jedi and The Big Chill. That's a four-year period. Damn. And he wrote the right. So it's John movies. Hughes versus him in the finals and Kasdan wins. Just from a pure screenwriting yeah. perspective. I mean, this he wrote like, Indiana, he wrote Raiders of the Lost Ark. A better hot take would have been, did Lawrence Kasdan create pop culture? I'm, it it <laughs> kind of feels that way, doesn't it? You know? <laughs> Coming up next. Casting what ifs. Kasdan wrote the role of Nick for William Hurt because they were working a movie and that was the only one he wrote the part for. Everyone else was kind of up in the air. Um, as you mentioned, Joe Beth Williams going close one to play Meg. I thought this was interesting. Kevin Klein met Phoebe Cates because she auditioned for Chloe and then it went to Meg Tilly, but they ended up hitting it off and that was that. The Phoebe Cates, Meg Tilly thing kind of yeah. got my head spinning mm -hmm, a little. Mm-hmm. Phoebe Cates, like almost probably too iconic Nick in Tilly 1984. Has, like, an otherworldliness, though, in this movie that I think really works. I think she works Chloe. better. We I really think Phoebe Cates is like too famous almost. Kasdan says ethereal is what he liked about her. Yeah. She, she had an ethereal quality. Uh, yeah. Phoebe Cates is um, at that time, too, just like classically hot. Yeah. You know, it doesn't work. Did, was it Meg Tilly or Jennifer Tilly who became the poker player? Jennifer Tilly, her sister. Kevin Klein wanted Goldblum's part. Because he thought it was a funnier role, but uh, they pushed him to the other part. And then his, his Jeff Goldblum's first wife is the girlfriend in the beginning credits, mm -hmm. who he then broke up with and ended up with Gina Davis. Huh. Who won I, an Oscar in a Lawrence Kasdan movie. I don't have an overacting there's, award. There's one more casting what if that's oh, just what is a it? rumor, which is Sean Penn for Alex. Yeah. I didn't <clears> believe that one. Um, <laughs> he would have been a little young at that time. Yeah, I thought time. he was too young. Fact checked. Sorry. <laughs> no, that's why I didn't list it because he was like 25. Like, I just thought yeah, he was too young. But it, definitely younger than Costner, right? Yeah. yeah. Overacting word. No, nobody in the movie except for the the preacher pastor. Where did Alex's hope go? He's really gunning for yeah. it. But He's like, I didn't know this guy, but I have to talk for five yeah. minutes. <laughs> <laughs> Best that guy award, Richard. Yeah, Don Galloway. Don Galloway. Did fucking... you ever used to watch Ironside, the show he was on? Of course. And apparently he was like a big libertarian, which mm. makes it kind of funny that he's in mm. this movie as this guy to imagine like yeah. what his like political kind of... Did you host him on your libertarian pod? <laughs> yeah. Did he talk about his experiences? Hands off. In the party? A yeah. podcast yeah. with Chris Ryan. Hands off. <laughs> <laughs> Over my dead body. Yeah. Hosted by CR. Dion Waiters, the preacher probably? <laughs> no, it's Costner, man. Yeah, come on. We don't, they don't even see his face. I know, but look, we spent twenty minutes talking Do about. Do we him. know that the, are those definitely his wrists in the in, in the inserts? That's a great question. Mm. We don't know. So you don't think that he qualifies because he's not actually in the movie? I think it's probably the preacher. What about I like the, the Costner. It's an interesting call. What about the cop? Mm. Oh, the cop. Oh yeah. Recasting couch. Just walk this through with me as a thought exercise. The cop is Mary Kay Place's brother, by the way, in real life. We put Glenn Clace, we give her the Mary Kay Place part. Okay. Meryl Streep's in the Glenn Close part. Mm -hmm. I feel like Glenn Close and Meryl Streep can't be in a movie together or the world will explode. That's what I like about it. It's just one Sierra's of those things. like sending emails. No, I'm not. I was just adjusting something. Oh. <laughs> He's doing some script writing. <laughs> Jesus. He's preparing for his big moment. Meryl Streep in the Glenn Close part and Glenn Close playing Mary Kay Place's part. I actually think that's a wonderful idea, and I'm not just saying that because you caught me typing. <laughs> <laughs> I think Meryl Streep in this movie as Harold's wife, I think it's a better movie. And you just want Mary K. Place to die in a ditch? Like what? what no, the I hell? think Glenn Close would have been an amazing Meg. I think she's a better actress than Mary K. Place. I love Mary K. Place, but Glenn Close is a better actress. 
I'm just trying to load. What was the... Meryl Streep in at this point? Like how... she's famous at this point. She's yeah, she's yeah. Stay, she's Kramer in Kramer the Sophie's sure. chat. Like she's done Sophie's Choice. Yeah. yeah, yeah, Sophie's Choice. That's yeah. pretty cool. It's a good All idea. Right. Have fast internet research. So the Santini house that Chris is going to buy, <laughs> it's in <laughs> Beaufort, Beaufort, South Carolina. Kasdan loved the San- great Santini so much he decided I'm just running back the house. Mm-hmm. This is one of my favorite half fast internet research in a while. So they did one hour documentary, the Big Chill Reunion. That's actually pretty bad. But uh, there was a supernatural event in the house where they were filming the movie and a sound technician recorded the sound of a ghost and got freaked out and everybody and it turned into a whole thing. So I thought that house might be haunted. Hmm. Yeah. So maybe you should buy it. Just giving, you, giving your interest. I'm, I'm already dealing with ghosts. How's that going? Uh, <laughs> interesting. <laughs> we had some developments? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You're, you, I mean, Chris and I, we, we, we experienced it. We also, were, we were in the open. space. Like, I don't know why you're like trying to get past it. Like, we can talk about he it. He doesn't want to, he doesn't like them to be addressed. You think they're listeners? You don't think they, they unsubscribed after Black Hat? <laughs> <laughs> you know what? Bill's just not making the show for me anymore. <laughs> I'll just stick to haunting him. <laughs> you just, you don't want to say anything. You Did, seem, you're really weird right now. Knocked on Ben's door two weeks ago. <laughs> yeah. yeah. No, it really did. <laughs> ben told complete, you this? Yeah. Okay. He's like, what did you want? I was like, nothing. He's like, someone knocked on my door. <laughs> what just happened? He like freaked out. I was downstairs. Uh, the Michigan football scenes are from a 1980 game between Michigan and Michigan State that Michigan won 27-23. I oh. miss guys wearing shoulder pads that look like they're knights of armor like like suits of armor yeah like there's like the Ernest Biner like shoulder yeah. pads yeah there's a whole bunch of stuff about how this film nobody wanted to make it even though Kasdan was as Sean points out scorching hot at the time but he said uh none of the studios got it it's the only movie I've ever gone around and pitched we pitched it literally 17 times and uh the guy who was running Carson's companies said if i can't get this picture made i shouldn't be in the movie business because this is what a screenplay is supposed to be yeah so. that woman martian Asseter, who very famous woman in hollywood history first real like powerful studio executive yeah. that was a woman in hollywood joe beth williams said for the costner scene they rented a big house in atlanta and installed bead curtains rock posters incense and 1968 life magazines and that in the scene, her character was living with William Hurt's character and ignoring Tom Berenger. And that Alex looked like a scruffy James Dean. <clears throat> um, and she just said it just didn't work. <laughs> and then uh, this was EW's 15-year anniversary review in 1998. Blame the big chill. Blame it for the unstoppable plague of soundtrack albums. For chatty ripoffs like 30-something. For giving the baby boomers one more reason to act smug and self-obsessed. Hell, blame the big chill for Bill Clinton. Watch the movie today and you'll detect a trace of slick willy and yuppie princes like Kevin Klein's track shoe tycoon and Tom Berenger's sellout TV star. Who wrote that, like Noam Chomsky or something? I don't know. It's <laughs> fucking, I think that, that, I think that created Gawker. Yeah. Um, yeah, well, that, that's sort of what I'm talking about. Like, when I was growing up, I was warned. That's exactly what I meant. Yeah, when Where you he, hear them, I can see, like, when Mary Kay plays, it's like, I thought I was going to be defending Huey and Bobby. Yeah. And they're scumbags, you know? It's like, all right, white savior stuff. But it, you guys agree, though, that, like, Kasdan knew all this yeah. at the time, you know? Like, yeah. it's a very yeah. self-conscious attempt to reckon with that. I completely agree with that. He's created seven characters, and you're not supposed to agree with them or right. like yeah. with everything. Apex Mountain, no for Close, no for Kevin Klein. Meg Tilly, it's probably the Rob Lowe movie. Which one? Masquerade. Felt like she was like a major star after that for like a year. Okay. That's her Apex Mountain? I don't know. What is it then? She never really had like, it's either this or Masquerade. I, I think mean, it's this because I've I never like heard of Masquerade. Psycho too. Oh, oh big, you're right. It's this because it's this and Psycho yeah, Good it was call. The same year. This is definitely Mary Kay Place, right? Yeah. Behringer's? No, Probably it's Platoon, 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 right? Yeah, Platoon. Platoon. He got what did we have for, for William Hurt? I, we already did William Hurt. Probably winning an Oscar, right? Uh, did we say Broadcast News? Yeah, oh, yeah. Broadcast News. 
Joe Beth Williams, I'm going to say yes. Poltergeist, right? Right before this. You said Poltergeist? Or I the... mean, she did Poltergeist right before right this. Before, so if you want yeah. to say like 81 to 83, it's or whatever it is. Santini House, would you say this or Santini? Probably the Santini. <laughs> <laughs> How about the Porsche 1972 911 Targa? Anybody else ever own that? Like, do we have any? any I don't know. I, I should have researched that better. <laughs> How about um, sleeping with your wife's friend because she is ovulating that weekend? Yeah. I'm going to say Apex Mountain. <laughs> CR? <laughs> Nobody ever asks me, you know? You never got the request. Yeah. If you got a fan letter from from one of your boys uh -huh. that was like, I want you to impregnate my wife, think, would I you think, do it? I think Phoebe would stab me in the heart for okay. asking. Okay. Yeah. All right. You would check in with Phoebe first. You'd be like, I got this the letter. Point I'm like, interested. Yeah, the what whole do you point think? is that the, the wife is pimping it See, out. I was like, Phoebe, I got to do it. <laughs> lady's husband, his hog is broken. <laughs> <laughs> I have this as Apex yeah. Mountain for you saying somebody's hog is broken. Yeah. See, I mean, broken hogs. I, I, I could spin off show I'm for you. I'm hog because John Fetterman was like, I guess if I got my hog cranked, it would be okay. But like... <laughs> <laughs> uh, I was like, that's my senator what about uh, how about Apex? Kasdan <sighs> that's a good question I'm gonna say yes I think it he's is he's coming off all the Star Wars yeah. and he's like who had more power than that dude he's you know directing this too yeah I think what about is. um backyard football this or wedding crashers oh you know I should have had a whole touch football list it's, I, we it's weird to watch football from like the early 80s because it's just so different now. Can we do... I so much gonna, more violent let's back do this then. Now. I was going to do this for pick and nits, but these touch football scenes, I've never been satisfied really with any of them. Mm -hmm. Where it's always like 2v2 and somebody's hiking it. And somebody's then blitzing. It's nobody's like, calling five Mississippi yeah. ever in any mm -hmm. of the games. And there's like just a blitz and people heaving it up and... The yard's always too small, and they just never get it right. They're, it's like, this where, is why we need the, the sports zone? consultancy. Yeah. You're like, <laughs> I'm right here. There's just no, there's call no me route out. tree that people are following. There's no hot routes, you know? Um, I love also, who plays two-on-two -two football? Like, nobody does that. There's yeah. all these other people, too. It's like, I want to see Lancer fucking sling it. Yeah, where's <laughs> Lancer? <laughs> I love doing this show with you guys. You're so weird. <laughs> what are you guys talking about? You're talking about What's, making know, a is, better two-on-two football Is Lancer two like a checkdown artist or does he go, does he go deep? He takes shots. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sitting here with Kyle Shanahan and Jeff Fisher, unfortunately. Send Gold Gold to the stick, you know? The heart wants what the heart wants and I've never been satisfied with the movie touch football scene. Okay. And you, what you, you can ask the Letterboxd community pretty, what, what their I, feelings are. I'll call are. them up. I'll see what they Maybe say. Maybe there's a touch football... Like list. Would thing. you please? There, actually, I'm sure there is. Will you make yeah. a post that's like an urgent letter, urgent, urgent message to my letterbox? It's not urgent. a blog, guys. You can't just like Fox you put a post can, up. You can't Fox put a heads. post up that's like, please tell me what the greatest backyard. <laughs> put a post up where in a review of the Big Chill. <laughs> Dear sirs or madam, please tell me the best touch yeah. football scenes. Yes, people probably would. They would respond. I've just never been happy yeah. with any of them. Me neither. Not with this one. That was when I knew I was going to marry my wife, by the way, when she was dusting one of my college roommates in a touch football game. I was like, yeah. Wow. Was it 7v7? Seven seven? No, it? it was like 3v3. Three three. Oh, okay. And yeah. you're doing like one Mississippi, like not, yeah, yeah no zero blitz. Was it RPOs or like play action? She like just, what were you guys doing? Dude, she did a stop and go. I was oh, like, oh wow. my oh. God. A little Mike Quick action. Yeah. yeah. Some juke action. Now, nice. now my son's playing both ways in high school. Yeah. She hit the stick in Madden. <laughs> nice. Um... <laughs> Best racehorse name, Running Dog? Uh, I think JT Lancer is pretty good for. <laughs> oh, JT Lancer is great. Good yeah. call, CR. Pick and nits. <laughs> JT Lancer's thumbs. Yeah. <laughs> how, so, how many rooms did, how many bedrooms did Harold's house have? Uh, I think. I don't how understand big was the that back house? house. How does the back house work? The back house that Alex that's lives where, in? That's where Nick is, right? In the movie, is Nick no, in that house? I think it's below the house. I think it's like that's a where Alex lived apartment. below the house. Yeah, oh, okay. there's then, the master bedroom. Mm -hmm. Joe Beth Williams gets her own room. JT Mary Kay Place has her own room. JT Lancer is rooming with, with Nick. Nick in the attic, and then Gold Bloom's in the kids' room. So that's five bedrooms plus the other room, and plus oh, so I guess property, the attic like, is the other room, and they have this property like half an hour or whatever away. Okay, what do you think of that property that Alex is working on? Good bones. Yeah, I was into it. I the, the Santini house is unbelievable. It's like one of the great movie houses we've ever had. Is it a plantation house? What do you mean? 
It's in Beaufort, South Carolina. Like no, is I, that a, I didn't do that. That didn't come up in my you, research. What do you mean? I'm just saying it's a great movie location. Are you trying to Jesus. cancel Harold? <laughs> well, I don't know. You know, maybe Santini needs to be canceled. You know, he was he he was he, not a good he, guy. He was a tough guy. Yeah, I didn't research the house. Maybe I should have. It was really nice. <laughs> Did you buy it? No. <laughs> um, more picking nits. Okay, we mentioned Kevin Klein's accent. Hmm. I'm confused how Harold's company had stock. I thought that was weird. Yeah, it's like a publicly traded. It's a small, traded. publicly traded running company in South Carolina. It's a good point. I think it's throughout the South. I it's think like, Nick, got... I'll, get you, I'll get you some stock. It's, yeah. It's like, what are you, are you trading on the NASDAQ? Did you, were you there for the Monday bell for running dog? Like, it's it's interesting. It's also like he obviously is compulsively telling everybody about this as, as coked out Sarah tells him, you're going to ruin this whole thing if you keep yeah. Well, that's people. the other thing. Like, that's you that, know, that actually is the sequel, is Harold's in prison for SEC violations. <laughs> yeah, yeah. 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 Also, like, I'm committing a violation. I could go to jail by telling somebody this, so I'm going to share this information with a drug my runner. drug dealer friend, yeah. Nick, yeah. Yeah. who's just a complete fuck up. And Nick's like, I have a key in my wheel well. I don't need your fucking running dog stock. <laughs> <Right. laughs> you know? Just give me a wrench and a I'm, car and I'm, I'm good. I'm the Medellin cartel <laughs> East Coast provider. <laughs> 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 I had a lot of questions about that. And then obviously... Um, Would you insider trade if your boy started a sneaker company? I mean, we went through it. We did? The, with the, the, the ringer. Were you, we inside, you were insider trading? No, we couldn't tell anybody. Yeah, I was. No, we were course. all completely terrified. Yeah. We were afraid to even like mention it to our wives. Yeah. I still haven't told her. <laughs> <laughs> she figures something's different. Uh, any other pick and nets? Uh, I don't think that Nick would be as chill about a bat flying through his window after three lines of cocaine as he is in this movie. Mm. He's just kind of like, oh, wow, bats here, you know? Uh, and bats also, are scary. Yeah. Harold, I'd be so much more scared of bats. Yeah. Bats they're are fucking terrifying. flying yeah. rats with rabies. But like, you, you, we've seen the second half of Goodfellas. I yeah. don't think like Henry Hill would be like, oh, a bat, you know? <laughs> uh, and then. Harold this was the only bat that we had. <laughs> Harold really bought. Karen, <laughs> you left the window <laughs> open. Did I tell you I watched? I watched uh, Flying to Boston last week. AMC on Directv. They had Goodfellas, and I watched Goodfellas on AMC. They're doing this new thing now with the bleeps, where they just make them silent. Yeah. They don't mm. bleep them. Yeah, yeah. It's like end zone celebrations. It's now. great. Yeah. But I was watching. I think of that. I think of CR now with that scene. <laughs> <laughs> what do you mean you flush it down the toilet? It's sixty thousand dollars. It's all we had. Uh, you own that scene now. You really do. It's Thanks. your scene. Now. Leota passed on. Leota's and gone, to and you. now yeah. it's CR. I'll go tell Marty that at the Killers of the Flower Moon <laughs> premiere. <laughs> what other nitpicks? Well, I, the only other thing was just like Harold really bombs that eulogy, and then he like totally pulls it together afterwards. There's no like, hey man, you really like fell apart up there. Mm. It's just like, hey, you guys want to come back to my house? That's a really good point. Uh, having seen what happened to Kieran Culkin's character in uh, yeah. in Succession, you know, they really, they didn't let him forget that one. Also, is that the guy you want given the eulogy? You know, when Alex bonked my wife. <laughs> <It's a> great <laughs> point. It was, it was tough for all of us. Uh, I have a nitpick. Yeah. If something like this happened, would you really let Meg Tilly's character hang around you and all your friends? Yeah, but Wouldn't how you want would to get you... the fuck out of here? No, because it's they're, they're like it's all good. It's the late sixties vibe of like yeah, property but, is. Theft. But she's like such an airhead and weird hang. Yeah. yeah. That well, when you watch the movie, you're kind of like get the fuck out of here, man. That's what like, I, mean. I want to see all these people interact. But at this point now, I'm like this is kind of makes sense that this outsider is here observing these people and be like, I think you need her because like she, she makes that comment at one point about how you guys, I don't think about the past like you guys do. Mm -hmm. I always, and it's also, she's my supposed past to be a younger fun. person who's like, I don't look at the world the same way you guys do. I'm doing yoga. Yeah. It's like, whoa, cutting edge yoga, 1983. <laughs> she's yeah. doing like little, like some Fonda exercises, right? Yeah, she is. And just kind of, it's just kind of a device. Yeah. You know, it feels like to draw a contrast. I'm fine if she's not in any of those scenes. Sequel, <laughs> prequel, prestige TV, all black cast are untouchable. I think it's all five. It's it's I would watch I would watch it, I, all I, the I versions of this. I completely agree with you. I would watch like a prestige TV version of Nick and Nam. You know? <laughs> and then he, <laughs> with an all black cast. He's like the he's like white American gangster bringing drugs no. back from Vietnam. Yeah. The, it's the, like the, the black chill, like they they made the black chill. Like isn't the wood like the black yeah. chill? Like they've, they've done tried this. a few yeah, times. Yeah. yeah. 
is this movie better with Wayne Jenkins, Danny Trejo, Frank Vincent, new edition, <laughs> Catherine Hahn, Steve Buscemi, Sam Jackson, JT Walsh, or Philip Baker Hall? I was thinking about Wayne as uh, Sarah. <laughs> <laughs> Goddamn, Meg! I didn't know I was weekending with Super Mom! <laughs> Your biological clock is drowning out the band and the staple singer's rendition of the weight. I hope you're serious about parenthood because I'm sending you my husband with a motherfucking brick of genetic code. You're about to be a parent a long fucking time, big boy. That was good. That's what I was tweaking. That was great. That was at your workshop? Yeah. (laughs) You're about to be a parent a long time. Uh, who's the juice? You still got it. You still got, you still it. got it. it. Great right. job. When it's the three of us, I really try to bring it. Yeah. <laughs> Just one Oscar who gets it? Uh, Kasdan. Yeah, Kasdan. For what? Screenwriting? Yeah, it's cr- yeah. it's crazy. He didn't win for original screenplay with Benedict. Was it Terms of Endearment that won? Yeah. No, that was adapted screenplay. I think oh, right. uh, that's McMurtry. Who was the one? Who won original? I can't remember. Horton Foot for Tender Mercies. Oh, that's a good movie. Come on. You don't like that movie? Nah, Big Chill should have won. Okay. Probably unanswerable questions. Did Meg get pregnant? I guess we litigated that. Uh, we'll, I, nev- we'll never yeah. know. They never had a sequel. Why was the Rutledge scholarship such a big deal? What do you think it was? Probably like it was like sponsored by like some corporation that Alex didn't agree with. Yeah, or it something. felt kind of like the Rhodes like Raytheon scholar yeah. thing. Like a yeah. Rhodes scholarship? Yeah. yeah. So. Was, there's a lot of reading between the lines, which I actually like, but so he turns that down. He goes to Vietnam and gets fucked up in Vietnam. No, I don't think Alex goes to Vietnam. I, I think, think so he either. he drops out of school and then just like kicks around the country for a while. Yeah. I think Nick's the only one of them who went to Nam. I think he's a little more of a, just a drifter. But we don't know that he didn't go to Nam. We don't. They don't, but, but you would have he, thought that they would have said that. In so what eulogy. happened to Alex then? That's what the movie is about. No, but but even from the Rutledge Fellowship, he turns it down. I think that there's something just like, happens there are over those a bunch next of people who are living on the edge slash in the counterculture and they're like yeah. rejecting what society wants from them. Then most of them are like, eh, fuck it. I'll go, I'll go make money. I'll go mm-hmm. start a family. I'll go be a lawyer. I'll go be an actor. And Alex and Nick get stuck. And yeah. they're just like, I can't go be part of society now. Mm-hmm. You know? Yeah, I, I think, always took it as Alex was also in Vietnam and got messed up there. I never thought of that. It's possible. I always just thought he was clinically depressed. Yeah. Well, he bounced back at American Flyers. <laughs> Bull fucking Durham. Maybe, maybe you're <laughs> Any other unanswerable questions? Yeah. Would you, would you guys invest in my club? I was still wondering about this with Michael. You've been doing this for years. Well, you just I, shit or get off the pot. I think as a bar, I've already got you guys down, right? As investors? Yeah. I'm out. But if, if what if I was like, I'm opening a club, like nice guy? I think club <laughs> is just one in 50 chance it yeah. works. Okay. Good to I'm know trying especially to if Michael was running it and skimming off the top. Could you imagine Chris as like uh uh <laughs> what's the character's name from Boogie Nights? <laughs> oh, Louise. Louise. <laughs> <laughs> just trying to just trying to sidle up to every young woman that no, I want to open up. I want to open a bar, regular bar. Can I ask you guys a question? Yeah. You, so you're officially Gen X, right? By birth? Uh, I don't. I know. don't. We don't count Chris. Yeah, I think I might be too too young. Seventy yeah. seven. What is that? Gen X is like you had to be there in college or right out of college in the early 90s. Yeah. I'm not until 90. So then what are 96. you? I think it's Y, isn't it? No. Well, yeah. millennial would be next, but you're not a millennial. Millennial is 1980. Isn't, literally, isn't there a generation Y? How many years is that? Like four years? I don't know. I don't Chris's really generation just drafted off our fumes. <laughs> it says Gen X is 65 to 79. Oh, I, I'm so almost I I'm late X. Shit. Okay. Yeah. I, I, I think you, I, I always thought you were X. So as two Xers, yeah. He, he's you, always mad about having to share yeah, it with me. That's fine. I'll share it. <laughs> Why are you mad about that? I'll share it. You and Chris. CR, you guys are you guys are boys. I'll share it. Your brothers. Him. Wasn't not an official Gen X. Do you feel closer to boomers or to millennials? Oh, boomers. Boomers, unquestionably. You both say boomers. Yeah. To millennials? Yeah, yeah, I think so. I'm a millennial. I like you. <laughs> <laughs> I set myself up for that one. Okay, good to know. That explains a lot. Does it? Yeah. Well, that's why you host the Libertarian Pod. <laughs> Hands off. <laughs> Put Best. me and Karen's wife. <laughs> that was great. How long did JT Lancer last on the air, and what was what was uh, 
Oh my God. Don't. What was Sam's next 10 years looking like on IMDb? <laughs> I have thoughts. Four seasons. So like first, late- first two seasons of a top 10 show. Makes it to like 1987, 88 range. Yeah. And then canceled. Canceled. Takes a year off. And then he's in a legal drama and he's a lawyer. Oh, so he's in LA law. Yeah. Uh, alternate idea. Does Lancer for a couple years. It's successful. He leaves the show because he's like, time to test myself on the big mm-hmm, screen. Mm-hmm. Oh. Plays like a deaf country singer. Goes poorly. Nice. Yeah, mm-hmm. nobody goes to see it. That's not what we want from Sam. Right. And then he has to go crawling back to TV where he plays like the bad guy on some No, then he's the in show. he's in a movie in the late 80s that's about like some sort of terrible incident Erotic in the thriller. South. Oh. No, and like <laughs> where he's like the evil sheriff who's oh, like yeah. a racist right. and somebody dies. Right. Yeah. And he tried that he makes a right. dramatic run. Like an on that. extreme prejudice yeah, style but movie. It doesn't yeah. work. Right. What's his country his 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 country movie is what? Broken country? What's it called? Uh, yeah. Or yeah. like Out of Rhythm. Sh- sure. Yeah. Quiet country. Tone deaf. Silent country. Silent country. So Silent then country. That's good. Sam ends up on like an arc on Friends. Oh, oh, like Tom Selleck. Yeah, like the Selleck kind of run. But he I can't guess be he's on basically Friends. just the Selleck run. But is it like, is he on Caroline in the City instead? Like, where does he get? Yeah, something he, like okay, that. Right. That's pretty yeah, good. Or, or Cheers. He starts dating Rebecca in like but 1991. 10 years later, Netflix revives JT Lancer. It's new 10 episode series. Right. Son of Lancer. Oh yeah, he's back. Yeah. Sam's working again. Yep. And cast in that part it's is Kevin Meg's bastard son. daughter. Yeah. Or son. Son. Daughter. Harold's bastard son. <laughs> yeah. That sounds great. This could be a good show. Harold's bastard. <laughs> <laughs> Best like double fucker. <laughs> Best South double Carolina. feature choice with this movie. Grand Canyon, right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. A little more mixed on Grand Canyon. Me too, but it feels like the right double it, feature. But it is a very interesting like through line of of this kind of person throughout the next couple of decades. I do really like the scene when uh Danny Glover gets the gang to let him take the car away because it's his job. Mm-hmm. I think that's just a, I think Danny Glover is really good in that movie. I think I only like that movie because of Danny Glover. I don't really like that movie that much. It's it's just an eerie artifact of history because it was released like two months before the LA riots. Right. So it it, it now seems like such an odd, th- odd little snapshot. The Andy and Red Zawane Award for what happened the next day. If I gave you Nick is arrested for drug possession versus Harold gets divorced, what happens first? Nick Nick's going down. Okay. Like I, I already think he's got one strike with that sheriff anyway. Yeah. Now than off yeah. to him. Yeah. Uh do you think Harold and Sarah are still together to this day? There's no way. No. Maybe like he lives at the summer house and she lives up in the city house, like kind of thing where okay. it's like married and named only. Do you I think- can't believe he forgave her forgave her for the Alex thing. I, yeah. That's where that gen, that generation, they kind of moved to their Is own. Harold our greatest cuck? <laughs> <laughs> no, man. Harold's Harold's probably he's like- Phil Knight. He, he probably owns the- That's Car- what I'm saying. Yeah, he owns, he owns the, the Carolina is Panthers. He, is he the winningest cuck of all time? Uh, how long do you think Nick and Chloe last? Oh, like a week and a half. Yeah. Yeah. Not long. She's like, sorry, I didn't understand. You said your hog doesn't work. I was a lose. <laughs> do, <laughs> do you think? Do you think this? Is this thing on? It's like, <laughs> She's like, I joke? told you. I told you it doesn't work. Is that a you joke did? about how he's a radio? No, what was part of that? Don't you understand? I told you that two but nights is, ago. Is that why it doesn't work? Yeah, I think he had an incident in Vietnam, stepped on a mine or something. But then what happened when they hooked up? Like, what actually happened? Ooh. A lot of oral sex. Yeah, he's a master of that. <laughs> it's like <laughs> right. Spider-Man. He has to get better at oral sex. Do you think that Harold secretly hired Nick to date Chloe so that he could then break up with her and kick her out of Harold's house. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, because Chloe's possible. got squatters rights coming up. That's what I'm yeah. saying. Yeah. So is he using her as a, a wedge? We forgot to mention when Harold... Is this thing on? <laughs> when uh, Nick gives Goldblum the the quaila, like maybe take one of these because he's just trying to knock him out so he can make a move on Meg Tilly. Yeah. I was like that. I always thought yeah. that was like stinky. Yeah. Love to drug my friends. <laughs> what piece of memorabilia would you want from this movie? <sighs> Portia. Well, I you know, it probably doesn't run. I like Michael's Village Voice t-shirt. 
mm-hmm. was pretty cool. We didn't talk about the the sneakers. I thought the running dog. Game worn running dog sneakers would be pretty good. The yeah. record collection, I think, would be really good too. I could and the really, coffee maker. I could really go for Richard's sandwich right now. No, Corned beef sandwich. Yeah, yeah. What do you think of um, the the sort of using the video camera to do interviews throughout the movie thing? Do you like that? I kind of liked it because it's yeah. very like eighties. Nick's, yeah. Nick's self interview is awesome. Yeah. yeah, there was this moment with cameras in the mid eighties where everybody was like, "Whoa." You turn this on and you tape and then you're on the TV. It, it does kind of capture that. Mm-hmm. And then people would just sit there and watch terrible videos they made of each other. So I'm not against it. I like it too. The Coach Finstock Award, best life lesson. Everyone sells out. What's it's, the like, lo- it's like, it's. I always liked Meg's line about like, it's a cold world out there. And like, sometimes I'm worried I'm getting cold too, kind of. Yeah, it's, it's not a lesson, but it's like uh, there's, a truism. It's kind of no way to answer this one because this movie has so many <laughs> smaller lessons. I'm still ruminating on you and CR making fifty grand a year doing what you love. Oh, I thought you were going to say <laughs> just, I'm still ruminating on me and Bill being Kyle Shanahan and Robert Sala for two percent. <laughs> I just don't know how you do two on two football game with with no Mississippi. I I was it's the always, dumbest thing I've ever seen. I love pickup football and trying to introduce like very dense verbiage to play mm. calls and stuff. Like if you that. could cast one member of the Ringer staff to be your number two on your two on two football team, who would you cast? Probably Craig. Craig's got height. I can alley oop. Wow. Throw alley oop. I'm kind of a nightmare downfield. Craig's good. Yeah, yeah. Craig's kind of physical. a nightmare downfield. I got hands. But you're the pickings, and it's he's like, the pick. It's like Anquan Baldwin. But I, Anquan Bolden, I can't speak. <laughs> He's like He's Alec like, Baldwin. <laughs> it's like Alec Baldwin out there. I had like big physical receiver. Who would yeah. you pick? Mm, Mal. <laughs> Mal is tenacious and will not lose. Uh, you just give her a ton of He would absolutely blow out a calf or something <laughs> oh, two minutes in. A he, Rogers? <laughs> t- totally. It's like lifting three hours a day. It's gonna be so running ready. around in a he's football ready for field. Combat. No, he's limping off. Jeff Chow's pretty big. Yeah, but Jeff Jeff's back is is always like yeah, he's got to go. back. That's issues. true, but I've seen him with a driver though. He can really yeah, he he's got some launcher, power. But yeah. like, let me let me see him in the flat with two running linebackers coming at him. You know, <laughs> I think it's two on two. <laughs> Austin Gale would be interesting because he would bring like 130 plays to yeah. the game, and like eight oh, of them yeah. would be amazing. I want him to coach my team. Yeah, yeah, definitely. So I can't coach your team. <laughs> definitely not. <laughs> No, sorry, Shanahan. Who uh, who won the movie? I did the Cheesecake Factory. <laughs> <laughs> um, I always say that the cast and you know the director, but in this case, it feels like what a personal movie. You know, like it. He he I made so. he made the generational movie. I think it's cast in as yeah. well. Craig, I love this movie. I adored it. This is immediately a top five all time of, of rewatch those movies I have not seen before. Wow. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah. High praise. Very, very um, enjoyed it. Um, yeah. I, I love, I love movies about friendship. I love movies about just like, like I love singles. I love kicking and screaming and this falls under that category to mm-hmm. me. The realism of this movie and I, I wonder if I, I, I kind of gravitate towards these movies because I find that there isn't a lot of realism and stuff made now. There's not a lot of great stuff made about living in 2023 yeah. um, that I can relate to. It's all very big ideas, uh, you know, high concept things. There's just not a lot of people in rooms. Um, honestly, a lot of like realism, day to day stuff is on TikTok, and it's just like people joking about what it's like to be a young person nowadays. So I don't know if that's why I like kicking and screaming and singles. It's like, wow, these people were making movies in the moment about what it was like to be a young person in the moment, mm-hmm. and I don't find I have a place to go for that right now. Mm. Um, also. I was thinking about if this movie was made today with people my age or something, like 10 years from now, my friends meet up after 15 years and just how much worse the music would be that we're listening to. Like we're playing like Levels by Avicii. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you're, you're all staring at your phones, like, playing Levels. We're like you're dancing around the kitchen island to like Kygo and like <laughs> I Got a Feeling by the Black Eyed Peas. <laughs> <laughs> yes and no. You'd find music that is actually good that you love. I, th- that was what we listened to in college. It was it was Kygo and house music. And that yeah. was like the main... That's sort know. of what I was saying where it's like Motown is still Motown. Like you can still put on Motown songs and be like, this is the best song ever written. Yeah. And it's an okay thing to say out loud. Totally. It's not just blanket nostalgia. Yeah. Also, you guys missed... Uh, I wish you guys talked about Michael Moore, the Goldblum character. 
The other trope about friends on a trip is there's always one guy who sleeps in way too late and yeah. misses the cleaning You're miss every morning. Mini dramas. Yeah. yeah. Sleep this late. He comes down. It's eleven. The kitchen's clean. Like everyone's already. <laughs> Are we the first walk. ones yeah. up? Yeah, I love <laughs> yeah, that yeah, line. Such yeah. A good line. Yeah, we didn't really talk about Michael quite enough. There's always that that group, the one guy. It's like you're not a hundred percent in on. He's the guy. like kind of weird, but you have you're friends with these people because because like proximity, right? And everyone yeah. just kind of accepts his weirdness. Yeah, and just you know ignores and Her, it. Hertz character calls him out in the end in that one part. But I could like, say you're using manipulative, whatever. But he does like he he, he kind of is so cynical that he's just like, oh, I'm so hurt, you know? Yeah, like, right, right. Also, I didn't know Behringer had it like that. Behringer was swagger. kind of a missile back yeah. then. Yeah. Wow. He, he had the swag. Yeah. Yeah, it's weird. I don't know who else was kind of like him in the 80s. Also, I, th I, I think, think Michael Behringer Douglas... Was, I think he was 34 in this movie, Behringer. They don't make 34-year-olds like no. they used to, man. I'm almost 30. Like... Behringer that's a, looks that's like a, a different kind man. of first thirty yeah. years. True. Yeah. He's got that thing that a lot of movie stars back then had. He has a giant head. Yeah, he's yeah. got his face is wide. No, it's like him, Sam Elliott. You yeah. can see him yeah. like but a skull like lad. Six, yeah, you know, he's tall. That's what Behringer missed his calling with the Scott Taylor Glenn. Sheridan universe. Yeah, mm -hmm. oh, like yeah. Taylor Sheridan. Where are you and Tom Behringer? Yeah, good. pull him in. I'll crank out three more shows next year and get Behringer. Right now he's taping. He should revive the substitute. But but said it Did in the you old see that west. Picture of Taylor Sheridan with Jerry Jones over I, the weekend. Certainly that wasn't Jones a picture. Like, they showed sir, him during sir. the game. Yeah, yeah, I was watching. It was great. Sheridan's going to buy the Cowboys. Yeah, probably. Uh, you can probably afford it at this point. <laughs>